Hi, everybody. Let's have a meeting. Uh, Tony, would you please call the roll? Sorry, Jimenez? Corrales? Here. Cohen? Here. Crosco? Present. Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Here. Foley? Mahan? Here. Here. Jones? Present. Ricardo? Present. And Jimenez is here. Thank you. Great. And Customer Jimenez is here for the record. Okay, great. Uh, welcome. We'll call the meeting in order for the afternoon of September 20th. Uh, please rise if you're able for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> All right, uh, today's invocation will be provided uh, by Evergreen Islamic Center Board President uh, Faisal Yassadi, and I believe Council Member Arenas will tell us more. Thank you, um, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm a council member for District 8, and I'm just really honored to introduce Faisal Yazadi, who will be leading our invocation today. And I believe Raina is with, with him. Um, from uh, the congregation. Um, and this is our Evergreen Islamic Center. Uh, Faisal is the board president, uh, but he's much more than that. He's a community leader and just the soul. Uh, I, I think he represents the soul of, of the Islamic Center and the wonderful people who, who um, congregate at our EIC in Evergreen. Um, the Evergreen Islamic Center began under the umbrella of the South Bay Islamic uh, Association in 1986, and as the Muslim uh, community just grew, uh, so did the IEC. And after years of hard work, they were able to build a beautiful new mosque in our community, and I got the opportunity to see it. The, the before and after is just tremendously, uh, just tremendous a difference. Uh, they will soon begin phase two with the construction of a community center, and I'm really excited about that. Um, they're deeply committed, committed to serving our community. They host monthly food distributions on site and provide hot meals for the unhoused in various parks throughout the city. In addition to food distribution, they host a free health care clinic, which is open to all residents over the age of 18 an emergency preparedness night, clean air day, civic engagement opportunities, and various other events that support the community, both in Evergreen and throughout the city. I'm so proud of the work that the Evergreen Islamic Center has done and the friendship that they have extended to me um, and to our, our city. And they continue to do the, all of this wonderful work um, for our community. Thank you, Faisal, for sharing your prayers with us today. Good afternoon. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Honorable Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. Uh, through the years of community service and through my center, I've gotten to know many of you personally. Uh, so thank you again. It's good to be here. Uh, during this very special month of National Hispanic American Heritage, as we celebrate this special month, I thank my you know Latino leader, uh, Sylvia Arenas, from District 8 for inviting me. Uh, it is an honor to be here. As the, as, the, as the invocation speaker here for this, uh, for this special, uh, special session. Uh, before, before I get started, I'd like to quote uh, uh, a few a verse from the scripture, from the Holy uh, Quran. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read it in Arabic, then I'll do a quick uh, rough translation of that. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah zina yittufikuna fi sarai wa zara'a wal kazimin al-ghazb wal afina al-nasi wa Allah yuhibbu al The translation to that basically roughly means is, those who spend in his cause, in his in ease and in adversity, and those who restrain anger, and those who forgive mankind, and the God, the only God, loves those who do good. So what it means basically in this context is you're the people who have actually uh, taken up the task of doing good, whether it is adversity, whether it's ease, uh, whether it's good times or bad times, and you have restrain yourself from you know reacting to people who may be criticizing to you uh, who may be you know uh, accusatory or who may be questioning and you have actually put your anger your personal egos aside and you have uh, taken up the mantle of serving 
mankind. And to you, God is with you, and he says, you're doing good, so I will do good to you. So that said, I want to just do, do a quick prayer. As we gather here collectively in this body, uh, I ask the, the mighty Lord uh, to give the strength uh, to the people in public service, uh, to give them, uh, to make their commitment stronger, uh, and may God, you know, make them successful in this path as we invoke the good and the bad, as we fight for the community, as we gather here today. Uh, so I pray to the Lord to give us, give us the strength as we move forward. Uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, I, I didn't know how much time I had, so I tried to, you know, keep it within, you know, two, three minutes. So unless anybody has any questions, I'll take your leave. Uh, I pray again, once again, for everybody's well-being and wellness. Uh, God bless America. God bless us all. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Faisal. <clears throat> and thank you for all that you do for the community and for the, that, all that your congregation does for our community. Okay, let's go to our ceremonial items. Uh, we'll begin with Councilmember Davis. Uh, we're going to recognize and proclaim National Preparedness Month. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to bring forth this proclamation today to raise awareness for the need to be prepared for emergencies. National Preparedness Month is an opportunity for us to take time to create plans in case of emergencies. And we all know that we have many possible natural disasters here in our city. We have experienced just in the time that I've been in office, we've experienced floods, fires, power shutoffs, as well as small earthquakes, thankfully only small ones. And all of these things can be devastating to our community. At those moments, having an emergency plan in place can save lives and help us be more resilient during recovery efforts. I'm very happy today to have Ray Reardon, the director of the city's Office of Emergency Management, accept this proclamation and say a few words about the importance of planning for all types of emergencies. Welcome, Ray. Thank you, Mayor, Council Member Davis, and the entire council. Readiness, readiness for the next disaster relies on three layers of preparedness. The city's preparedness, the community's preparedness, and the individual's preparedness. Since 2017, the city has made significant strides since the floods at that time. They've updated plans, procedures, protocols. They've implemented alert and warning capabilities, trained EOC staff for response, and responded with tremendous flexibility and resources in response to COVID-19. We've also initiated the creation of what's known as a continuity of operations plan. There's so much more to do. I'm not here to list all the things we're gonna do, but I'm here to en enforce and encourage the development of our uh, partners, uh, preparedness with partners. During the COVID, we improved our engagement with community resources and our community-based organizations. We improved our communications and coordinations with the county, and we reinvigorated the Community Emergency Response Team program. We now have nearly 900 trained CERT members. That's quite an accomplishment in a short time. We've organized plans to integrate the CERT, the community response teams, into our response to the city. But most importantly, the third level is the most important, and that's you, the individual. We encourage all residents and businesses to be aware of the, the hazards. While Council Member Davis listed them, be aware of them and what they can do to your home and your business. Create the plans of what you're gonna do, how you're gonna respond after an earthquake or whatever warning you receive from our warning system. Create that emergency supply kit. Take the time to figure out what you need to have in your own resources when their resources may not be available. Join the other community teams like the SERP program or within your church, within your own residence, community and neighborhood. And most importantly, please sign up for the alert warning system at alertscc.org. Thank you.
the Ward Board suggestion, uh, you can sign up for the CERT program by going to the city website, Emergency Preparedness and website, sign up there for the CERT program. Thank you very much. Great, thanks for all that you've done, particularly in reinvigorating that CERT program, uh, getting nearly a thousand of our community members engaged. It's, that's wonderful. Uh, Council Member Esparza is here along with uh, some FMCI, Junior Giants Little League parents and coaches, and we want to invite them to come down. Thank you, Mayor. So excited today to uh, honor the San Jose Franklin McKinley Children's Initiative Junior Giants Little League with commendation today. The San Jose FMCI Junior Giants formed in 2016, serving the Santee community before moving to their current location at the Seven Trees Community Center in 2019. They provide a free eight week summer baseball program that is inclusive, co-ed and focuses on developing team building and character building skills. And now they play at the Tully ball fields. So it's just, including the whole community. The league is led by the extremely hardworking team at the Seven Trees Family Source Center, including Marisol Barajona, Michelle Esteban, Maria Garcia, Yen Din, Veronica Delgado, Briseida Duran, and Mireida Duran. And today we're lucky to have Coach Pete Peel and Coach Eric Elliman. And that's what we really want to highlight is what makes this program possible are the incredible volunteers and volunteer coaches who so generously give their time and effort to give our kids the opportunity to play ball. And I'd like to recognize the coaches who were able to join us today and recognize all of the 45 volunteers and coaches who make this league possible. It's hard to overstate the positive impacts that the Junior Giants has had in the Seven Trees community. And it's played an essential role in helping our kids and our community return to any kind of sense of normalcy uh, after the pandemic. The Junior Giants had 178 players in 2021, and this summer they had 284. And I know they have plans to grow it even more. These kids come from some of the neighborhoods that have suffered the worst public health and economic impacts of COVID in the entire county. And the Junior Giants have provided so many kids with the opportunity to play baseball and be part of this great community that they otherwise would not have had. So again, thank you to the parents, the coaches, the volunteers, and a big thank you to the Seven Trees Family Resource Center team and congratulations to the whole FMCI Junior Giants League on a great 2022 season. So proud to present this commendation today, but before we do the presentation, I'd like to invite Marisol Barajona to say a few words on behalf of the league. Hello everybody, thank you. I'm short. <laughs> Uh, thank you to Council Member Esparza and uh, Mayor Licardo for this honor. Um, so baseball is an American pastime and sadly many of our youth will not get to experience playing in an organized league due to the cost or accessibility. But fortunately, with the partnership of the San Francisco Giants Community Fund and the Junior Giants, Catholic Charities is able to bring this beautiful program to Seven Trees. Thank you to all of the volunteers, many of, who, of whom could not be here today, and to the FMCI team that work so hard to pull this league together. Uh, it's so much work to make it happen. So we will be back next season in the Seven Trees community, and my hope is to see all of the underserved neighborhoods in San Jose host a league in their own community. Thank you again for all of the support we receive. Go Junior Giants. Team effort, thanks to all the parents and coaches who support our gigantitos. Uh, 
Okay, we are now, uh, I guess, fresh in the glow of a wonderful celebration we had for El Grito. Uh, we are pleased and really honored to be joined by our Consul General and members of her office and the Comité and Council Member Carrasco. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to invite my, uh, my uh, fellow colleagues uh, who uh, were there with us, but who uh, formed a part of the first uh, 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 not majority, but half of the Council uh, of Hispanic Heritage. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for allowing me to do this today. This proclamation is special to me. Uh, it's special for obvious reasons, but mostly because it gives me an opportunity to acknowledge the diversity of San Jose, to recognize the contributions of our Hispanic community, and to remember my parents who helped build this city, along with those who have moved on without us and are no longer here. Today, nearly 63 million Hispanics, that's almost 19% of the U.S. population, call this great country home and carry with them their cherished language, traditions, cuisine, and an undeniable spirit of ingenuity and perseverance. And San Jose stands tall. It's both strengthened and unified by our creativity and innovation and amor al prójimo, our love for one another. September 15th through October 15th is the actual celebration and recognition of Hispanic Heritage Month, which captures the Independence Day of many of Latin American countries, including Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Chile, Mexico. And I want to give also a special recognition to our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico who celebrate El Grito de Lares and who, as you all may know, are, uh, are under a great deal of uh, uh, duress given the hurricane or the tsunami that hit them. Uh, so I, I invite you to consider uh, uh, the humanitarian in you and, and contribute to their, their uh, recovery. This, is, this isn't just a time of celebration, it's really a time of reflection. Uh, in the spirit of those men and women who picked up sticks and stones, who fought off Spanish colonization, I'm calling on the rest of us to honor the perseverance and resistance of our ancestors and to advocate for the advancement of our values and for the advancement of those resources and tools that are necessary to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. It's been mentioned earlier today, COVID-19 had a devastating impact on our communities. It was a perfect storm with no compassion for the Latino or the Hispanic community. Four out of the five zip codes that were most impacted had the highest rates of infection and had the highest loss of life. We're all on the east side of San Jose where the Latino lives. We lost our jobs, we lost our businesses, we lost our sense of security, and most importantly, we lost our loved ones. We're still recovering and the recovery will be slow. But how befitting is it that today, uh, as we're celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, it's also national, let me get this right, right National Voter Registration Day. And I bring that up because the Latino will make the difference throughout the entire state of California regarding the House of Representatives, regarding state legislature, and regarding mayoral races, all the way from Los Angeles to San Jose, it will be the Latino that casts that deciding vote. In San Jose, 117,000 Latinos are registered to vote. That's almost 23% of the registered voter population. It's the largest ethnic group in the city who helped build this city, who will vote people into office and who will make sure that those represent them and their families. We may not have famous names, but it is the Floreses, the Maderos, the Arriolas. It's the Rodriguez's and the Ortiz's, the Velasquez, who, who have built this city, who sometimes don't get recognition. And it's also the Esparzas, the Jimenezes, the Peraleses, the Arenas, and the Carrascos, who have worked so hard to make sure that our entire city it uh, maintains its inclusivity and its diversity, and we continue to be a welcoming city. I'm proud to see, serve with these men and women here on the council, with the entire council, but especially with the four other Latinos who have, in my opinion, made history. With that, it's my greatest honor to present today's proclamation. If you were at, yet, at last week's event, you know it was one uh, that will be talked about for years. 
I'd like to present the proclamation today to El Comité de Fiestas Patrias de San Jose, California. Guided with the vision of Mexican Consul General Alejandra Bologna, El Comité de Fiestas Patrias is an incredible group of elected officials, local leaders, business owners, committed to providing and preserving Mexican traditions and culture in the region. And through this partnership, they have been able to elevate our yearly event and reach uh, and the reach of our respective patrimony, showcasing our heritage to the Greater Bay Area and other neighboring municipalities. Help me in recognizing Consul General Alejandra Bologna, Jesus Flores, Maria Chavin Hernandez, Tomas Gonzalez, Tony Valencia, Melesio Bañuelos, Rodrigo Navarro Gonzalez, Carlos Merino, Adolfo Gomez, Erika Diaz, Paula Carvajal, Humberto Arrevalo, I want to recognize also my office for being part of this committee and working so hard day in and day out. I want to recognize Council Member Sergio Jimenez's office for also being part of the committee, as well as our very own Mayor, Sam Ricardo. I'm incredibly thankful to each and every one of you. Thank you for putting on a wonderful show and making sure that the Latino community is recognized. And Mayor, if you will, please. Come forward. I promise. Less than two minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member Magdalena Carrasco, and all Council Members. My name is Jesus Flores. I have the honor of being the President of the uh, Comité de Fiestas Patrias de San Jose, California. It is a great honor to be receiving this proclamation, and I am very proud of, to receive it in the name of our Comité de Fiestas Patrias. Um, Councilmember Carrasco already named the members of our, uh, our committee, but I want to give thanks to, first off, again, I want to say thank you to Ambassador Alejandra Bologna, Consul General de Mexico in San Jose, and to Consul Member Magdalena Carrasco, as they are the two founders of this Comité de Fiestas Patrias. They are the ones who invited our committee members to start working together with one mission in mind, to work in collaboration in the planning of these events with the firm intention of preserving the cultural celebrations treasured by the Mexican and Mexican-American communities in San Jose, especially the commemoration of Mexico, Mexico's national independence, also known as El Grito. I also wanna say thank you again to Zulma Maciel, Director of the Office of Racial Equity, Esmeralda Bautista from the Office of Mayor San Ricardo, Vanessa Sandoval from the Office of uh, Council Member uh, Jimenez, and to all council members that were able to join us during our celebration, also to Brian Camplet, to Ed Solis, to the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, to Chief Mata and all the San Jose Police Department for their great, great job, um, also to all of our attendees, volunteers, sponsors, and last but not least, I also want to emphasize our thank you to Kiara Arreola, Kim Ruiz, and all of the great team at District 5, as well as to Rodrigo Navarro and all the amazing team at the Mexican Consulate. Again, thank you very much. We cannot thank you enough for your support in making this the greatest Mexican civic event of the last 20 years. Thank you.
right, on orders of the day, does anyone in the council have any changes to the printed agenda? I, uh, <clears throat> I know that Councilmember Perales would like to adjourn today's meeting in memory of uh, Joseph T. Noonan, I think we all know is Joe, who passed away uh, too soon on August 2nd, 2022, at the age of 48. Councilmember Perales? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And I first want to recognize um, a couple of people who we have joining us. We have uh, Joseph Noonan uh, Sr., who is here in the audience with us. Um, we have Miss Linda uh, Pivar, a family friend, and Brian Friss also on Zoom watching. We have Jennifer Nicole Smoker, Joe's sister, and all his family and friends throughout the United States that have joined us today. Thank you for joining us. Today's meeting is being adjourned in memory of Joseph Joe Tyler Noonan. This is incredibly bittersweet as it was just a few months ago, as you all will remember when Joe was here in these council chambers, receiving a, a surprise council commendation on behalf of the mayor. Joe was born in Pennsylvania and raised in Elmhurst, Illinois, outside of Chicago. Joe's family moved to San Jose where he attended Rogers Middle School and Prospect High School. He spent a memorable year at Cuesta College in San Luis Obispo before returning to the Bay Area to work at Navtech and continue his studies. Joe honed his negotiation and people skills at a variety of tech companies, including Cisco Systems, JDS Uniphase, SPI Lasers, and G2 Planet. For 17 years, before he pivoted and chose to devote his professional abilities and charm to promote the people and places of the city of San Jose. Over the years, he worked with Broadway San Jose, the San Jose Downtown Association, Christmas in the Park, the Bay Area Furniture Bank, and the City of San Jose's very own placemaking team on projects such as Viva Calle, Viva Parks, and San Jose Alfresco. He also volunteered his time with One Step Closer, Therapeutic Writing, Hunger at Home, and Perseverance Preparatory School. Joe passed away on August 2nd, 2022, at the young age of 48, after bravely and gracefully enduring treatment for neuroendocrine tumors by the skilled team at Kaiser Santa Clara for over a year. Joe was a living spark, breathing light into everything he touched and always made it a priority to keep a warm, welcoming space for everyone. He was a visionary who also saw potential and what could be instead of what was. I believe we had a photo, I don't know if, uh, it didn't make it, we'll post it online. <laughs> um, so as the downtown council member, uh, I had the pleasure of working with Joe over the last eight years as he wore different hats. Um, one of those was in promotion of the downtown farmer's market was the photo we were, we were going to share of uh, Joe in his true spirit in the infamous banana outfit, if you ever saw him <laughs> riding through downtown, um, promoting the downtown farmer's market. <laughs> I remember how excited I was for our very own city when I found out that he was hired by us to be a part of our placemaking team. And I used to think that I was one of Joe's favorite people because of how well he always treated me. <laughs> then I found out that that was just Joe and that's how he uh, treated everybody as if you were his best friend. His eternal optimism, friendship and dedication to making our city what it is today will be dearly missed by everyone who knew him and worked with him. We will miss you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member, well said. And to uh, Joe's loved ones, uh, Joe's dad, uh, thank you for being here in person. It means a lot to all of us. And those of us, who, those who are able to join online as well. All right. Um, let's uh, vote now. No, we don't need to vote on orders of the day. Is that right, Norm? Just move forward. Okay, let's go to uh, the closed session report, Nora. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we do not have a report out of closed session today. Thank you. Item 10.1 is a land use consent calendar. Uh, I believe Councilmember Prowlis, you'd like to pull item 10.1A, which is the city initiated rezoning of the 520 parcels. That is true. Uh, would you like to speak on all 520 of those? We just do, one. Do regular consent, Mayor. <laughs> I just skipped the consent calendar, didn't I? I went from the closed session to the land use consent. I guess we'll go to the regular consent first. Why not? 
Um, Councilman Prowls, we'll come right back to you. Sounds good. All right, let's go to the consent calendar. Uh, would anyone like to pull an item on consent? Looking online for any hands. I don't see any from my colleagues, so let's go to the public. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. I uh, hope you can hear me. I, um, yeah, I had two items that I wanted to bring up uh, today that actually very nicely fit into the uh, items that were uh, the ceremonial items today. Uh, the first item, uh, fourth quarter financial reports for the fiscal year 2021-22. To uh, offer a quick reminder of uh, the work that Ray Reardon does, a thank you, and uh, in preparing a CERT for the upcoming years. Um, and, and just a reminder that I hope your fiscal uh, quarterly budget reports, I've always hoped that uh, they can offer a way to uh, speak to what to expect of our community issues, say in the next year, in the next few years. Uh, that can give a real sense, a weather vane of what to expect uh, natural disaster preparedness wise. Uh, good luck, you, you've done some terrific work on, on natural disaster preparedness issues. For it to be in your uh, budget reporting uh, can be helpful. And just the overall practices of uh, how natural disaster preparedness can be a part of the creature of uh, health and human services and racial equity ideas. Uh, good luck how to meld all of that together and working towards the concepts of future federal funding ideas um that's what i'm trying to learn how to discuss this sort of process thanks and with uh, i i wanted to compliment uh once again uh councilperson jimenez who is going to be traveling to both san diego and tijuana in the next few weeks to uh for 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 city cover conference issues good luck how he can address issues of uh San Jose, how they work with their gang issues in comparison to the uh, very heavy scene that's going on in Tijuana at this time. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, my comments are on item 212, uh, Council Member Jimenez's visit to, uh, to speak with the cities of international U.S. Mexico mayors. That's a pretty significant meeting. I'd like to know if uh, since the uh, raising the flag statue is going to be removed um, in December, um, I'd like to know if that's a topic of discussion, if you've ever considered the raising the flag statue being removed from public property um, as a topic of discussion with Mexico considering that the raising that this is the only statue in the entire United States since George Floyd that has been removed from public property that has as its primary symbol, the American flag. All other statues, no other statue in the entire United States has as its primary symbol, the American flag. All other statues are Confederate statues or Christopher Columbus. And so I would, I would, I would uh, like to know if Councilman Jimenez has on his mind or on his agenda to speak with Mexico about the removal of a symbol that stood for the declaration of war against that very country. Because I think this is significant considering that the meeting is being held in San Diego and the placement of the American flag here in San Jose is what put that border in San Diego in the first place. So since we're removing this symbol of the declaration of war against Mexico here in San Jose from public property, and you're going down to San Diego, I think it's, I think it's a relevant uh, topic of discussion to discuss with Mexico, to inform Mexico that a symbol of the- Back to the council. Back to the council. Move um, approval. All right. Let's go. I think your microphone on your laptop. Your Zoom, Mayor. 
He, um, you muted him. Grace muted you. You're good. Um, <laughs> just you, yeah. Jimenez. Yes. Perales. I remember my first day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cohen. Hi. Prosco. Hi. Davis. Yes. Esparza. Yes. Arenas. Yes. Foley. Hi. Mayhan. Hi. Jones. Hi. Licardo. Hi. I think. Yeah. You're good now. Just make sure you unmute this and leave your laptop alone. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to touch it. I swear. <laughs> All right. I've been muted. <clears throat> Moving on. Item uh, 10.1 is the land use consent agenda still. And uh, Councilman Pross wanted to pull item 10.1A. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and first off, thank you to Justin Daniels and Martina Davis uh, for working on this alignment of hundreds of properties uh, with uh, an insurance to align with our general plan designations as we are required to by state law. Uh, my office uh, has been contacted by actually several property and business owners over the last year regarding uh, the alignment of these land use designations. And as you might imagine, uh, not everybody knows what the underlying general plan designation might be for the property that they own. Uh, I was contacted by the property owner at 575 East Julian Street who purchased his home with the intent of operating a uh, ground floor business as, uh, as well as living there. He requested a little bit more time to explore his business options before the property gets rezoned. Uh, I am inclined to provide him with a little bit more time as a courtesy and after speaking with staff, uh, it did not seem to be problematic. With that said, uh, I would iterate here and I, I did uh, ensure my office iterated, uh, reiterated to the owner that the property will get rezoned uh, with our next um, hearing for um, from neighborhood, uh, excuse me, um, next hearing from neighborhood commercial to residential in order to comply with the Senate Bill 1333. So with that, uh, and with that one request, again, for this is 575 East Julian, um, just removing that one from this particular uh, vote, uh, I'll move approval of the remainder of 10.1. Second. All right, any, let's go first to the public, see if there are any public comment on this item. Chicanos? Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I think the, the original designation, the date of the, original, of the original designation would be helpful, considering that a lot of these land use designations to begin with were illegal because they were based on racially segregating these areas. So to, to think that you're going to align this, this property so that it aligns with state law, well, the current designation hasn't even been researched because if you research it far enough, you're gonna find that the original designation was created and made by means that were racially uh, biased, that were immoral, that were unethical, and actually illegal. And so to, to try to make something legal now, when you haven't even determined its original designation and how that came about, I think is irresponsible. And it's not really addressing the racial equity kind of tone that the, uh, that the uh, council is, 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 is uh, ostensibly trying to take. So I think the history of the original designation and how that was created is the start point. Thank you. Back to council. All right. Let's vote on the motion. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Frosco? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Item 3.1 is the report of the city manager. Jennifer? I have a yes from Frosco on the last item. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mary. I have no report today. All right. Item 3.3 is the approval of citywide insurance renewal. There's no presentation. Move approval. Second. Motion from Council Member Foley, second Council Member Sparza. Uh, let's go to the public. I have no hands up. Let's vote. Jimenez? 
Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 3.4 is the Monterey Corridor Working Group Report. There is a presentation on this item. Thank you, Rosalind, Nathan, and the entire team for your work on the report. And thank you to Council Members Esparza and Jimenez for your work with the task force. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, City Council, members of the public, Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager. Um, we are very excited to be with you today to present the Monterey Corridor Working Group Report. Um, this has actually been quite an uh, incredible partnership effort, um, and I'm really glad to be joined today presenting uh, with members of the working group um, in the box. So first, I would just like to uh, introduce first Kristen Brown of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, Tracy Fodolage of the San Jose State University. We have Jill Rodby of the Monterey Corridor Business Association who is joining us via Zoom. And city staff, we have Nora Chen who is assistant to the city manager. She has served as the lead staff coordinator this year. And we also have Nathan Donato Weinstein of the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. So as background, you'll recall that the mayor and council uh, established the working group in January of 2019 with the encouragement of council members Esparza and Jimenez. The working group was tasked with addressing the potential benefits, challenges, and effects of the convergence of the high-speed rail project, increased Caltrain station service, homelessness and land use opportunities through the general plan four-year review process, as well as the Santa Clara County Fairgrounds. The working group was comprised of a resident from District 7, one from District 2, business owner representatives, union representation, the Valley Transportation Authority, and the county fairgrounds. The study area extended from Alba, Al, excuse me, Alma Avenue in the north to Blossom Hill in the south. Ten meetings were conducted over the course of three years. The working group reviewed existing conditions, various pain points, and opportunities related to business retention, marketing, transportation projects, industrial market and beautify San Jose efforts. The group also analyzed over 15 sites along the corridor for potential redevelopment. I'll now turn the presentation over to Nathan, uh, who's gonna walk us through the corridor's profile. Thank you, Rosalind. Um, so what do we talk about when we're talking about the Monterey Corridor? Well. We're going to be discussing this area of our city as a business hub, but it's also um, a corridor that contains many residential neighborhoods in the core of our city and really made up of every housing type, everything from single family homes, market rate apartments, deed restricted affordable communities and manufactured homes. So we um, analyzed 18 census tracts that line the corridor to get a better look at this resident population. And what we learned is that the population here is highly diverse with nearly 80% of residents identifying as Asian and or Hispanic, which is about 10% higher than the city overall. You also tend to see a little bit less um, beyond high school educational attainment and lower median household income levels than the city at large. And why that matters is for resident workers in these demographics, both here on Monterey Corridor and elsewhere, it's really important that they have access to really good job opportunities that are well matched for their skill sets. And that's really where Monterey Corridor occupies an important 
and unique role in the city's economic ecosystem. So we'll look at the next slide here. So Monterey Corridor is home to 21,000 workers and roughly 3,000 businesses. And these tend to be sort of essential type businesses and work that cannot be done from home. Um, but it's not just the sheer number, and, and this is a lot of jobs for our city. It's also the diversity of the types of jobs. So in many business districts in, in the region, um, you tend to see more of a concentration of one industry or another. But what's really interesting about the Monterey Corridor is you have a balance of many sectors with strong showings in construction, building materials, manufacturing, retail, and others. If you're getting your home redone, new cabinets, redoing your landscape, there's a really good chance that the materials it took to build that stuff came from this part of San Jose. And there's a few reasons for this. It's the central location, the city's largest concentration of light and heavy industrial land, and flexible combined industrial commercial zoning that lines the corridor make it a good spot for many types of businesses, including retail, warehouse, building materials, manufacturing. And quite frankly, for many of the industrial businesses here, if they didn't have a home in this area, they likely would need to leave our city. And what else is cool is that the area is financially productive for us as a city. From a sales tax standpoint, the corridor throws off a significant amount of revenue um, and has recovered substantially on that front since the depths of the pandemic. All that said, there are clearly areas for improvement that could be made in terms of the corridor's quality of life and business conditions. And we'll be discussing some of the strategic directions and ideas and plans for progress in the following slides. With that, I'm handing it back to Rosalind. So from the community, business, and economic data and findings, the working group developed a vision that the corridor is a welcoming and connected community that celebrates the diversity of its people, as well as its economic and cultural assets that are supportive of its residents and businesses. Its history is important and bolsters opportunities, and thirdly, promoting livability and sense of place. The working group was beginning to formulate draft recommendations just before the start of the pandemic in March of 2020. And even though uh, the working group meetings actually paused for two years to support the COVID-19 response, the group provided enough guidance so that the city staff was actually enabled uh, to move forward on several items. And this slide highlights the progress that was actually made during that time. Planning and land use was a big discussion topic as working group members stressed the importance of leveraging the general plan four year review process that was underway at the time. And the new capital Caltrain station area plan was actually approved as part of the four year review process. Planning staff was able to secure funding from the State Department of Housing and Community Development and initiated the station area plan in March of this year. And the public engagement process is currently underway. New development capacity for the 14 acres surrounding the station includes 700 residential units and 30,000 square feet of office and retail space. Staff anticipates completing the plan and submitted to Council for action in June of next year. To bolster beautification efforts, Beautify SJ staff were able to forge an agreement with Union Pacific Railroad for their property along the corridor. And the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs contracted with the new business district manager who is helping to formalize the business association for the area. And working with council member Esparza's office, new gateway banners were designed and installed along the corridor. Transportation efforts also progress with the Department of Transportation receiving $7.5 million in funding to start the design and conduct the environmental analysis for the rail project Great Separations and the High Speed Rail Authority certified the environmental impact report for the rail project. Now I will turn the presentation over to working group member Jill Robbie of Sims Metal Management, a longtime business along the corridor. 
Jill has been um, a major advocate uh, for the businesses along the corridor uh, and improvement um, of the area and actually spearheaded the creation of the business association. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, council members and mayor. Um, as Rosalind just mentioned, I represent Sims Metal Management on Monterey Road. I participated in the working group and I'm really glad to see that the working group led by council member Esparza and council member Jimenez is taking shape to address the challenges to transform the corridor. Over six years ago, I started um, an informal business association uh, and invited uh, my business neighbors a lot in the corridor and it was called uh, the Monterey Corridor Business Association. We came together to work on issues that we were having in the corridor, including those that relate to dumping, litter, blight, the homeless encampments next to our facilities and sideshows. Uh, we wanted to work with the city and see if we could find some solutions. And we have been working with our council member, our mayor, and many other staff in the city. Um, I'm really encouraged, we're still working on it, but I'm really encouraged by the progress that the working group has made, um, including the banner program, um, the recent hire of a business manager to formalize the Monterey Corridor Business Association, and um, our website's under development, which is exciting. What you see in front of you is a couple murals that Sims actually did. Uh, they're on our buildings facing the Monterey Boulevard. And we wanted to you know, bond and honor the community that we work in. And um, we will continue to look for opportunities to beautify the area. And I'm looking forward to continuing this work and I'm excited to see the changes that they happen along the corridor. Thank you. And I will now turn the presentation over to Kristen Brown. Kristen. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. The Silicon Valley Leadership Group was originally called the Santa Clara County Manufacturers Group. This means that SVLG's history is rooted in the manufacturing industry an industry that is important to the Monterey Corridor and the larger San Jose region. The Monterey Corridor is a business and manufacturing hub, and we are supportive of the creation and preservation of middle income jobs. For a long time, the Monterey Corridor has been a place for innovation and a lab for the technology industry. If a technology company wanted to test out a new idea, they would go to a manufacturer along the Monterey Road and build a prototype to test. We believe this working group effort will enhance the Monterey Corridor's inherent asset as a business and manufacturing hub, a job creator, and a future destination for visitors and residents. In addition, SVLG has played an important role in advocating for funding for Caltrain electrification and is supportive of the high-speed rail. We believe that better public transportation systems will support a vital economic ecosystem along the Monterey Corridor. That means people can visit, participate in the local economy, and experience an enhanced quality of life. Next, I'll turn the presentation over to Tracy Fertilage. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me today. I represent San Jose State University. We deeply appreciate the opportunity to be part of this project, part of this working group, and to engage deeply in the conversation with the city related to planning. As you may know, the university has engaged in a master planning effort for its main and south campus over the course of the last about year and a half. We started pre-pandemic as well. That effort is very important. It speaks to the future vision that San Jose State University has for itself in terms of its physical manifestation. During these conversations that we've had throughout this last year and a half or so, it's been very important for us to not just talk about what it will take uh, within the campus itself, within our boundary for our campus to succeed, but also how do we partner and how do we, we fully recognize that we are enmeshed in a community? Um, and so opportunities to engage with the city, with community groups, and with others uh, around not just the campus, but how we spill over and into the city and how our students, our faculty, and our staff also become a vibrant part 
of, of city and, it, and the life here is very important. As you look up onto the screen, you can see that we have an illustration that shows the location of our main campus and then down toward the bottom, the location of our south campus. The connectivity between those two campuses is very important to the university. We have ongoing frequent discussions about how do we get people back and forth between these two spaces, especially as we think about our, our future over the next 20 years and how much transportation will, will change. We also recognize that beyond transportation, part of the vibrancy of the South Campus is rooted in what's happening in between the South Campus and Main Campus. That means what's happening within that community, the walkability of that community, the ability for life to happen between that's not about the campus. Having opportunities to participate in this uh, Monterey Corridor project and working group has been very beneficial. South Campus is very different from the main campus. We recognize in our vision, and if we go to the next slide, I think you will see our master plan vision for the build out of our South Campus. Very different than it is today. You can see some level of CEFQ Stadium, but you can also see the building of our new Spartan Athletic Center as well as a complete redesign of the entry into that corridor. As you look into that South Campus, what you are beginning to see is our vision, which is that area of our campus doesn't just serve our academic, uh, athletic, and, and recreational needs, but it also starts to become a sports and entertainment district and a center for those types of activities for our campus, as well as the general community. The work that you are doing and the vision that you have and the work that this group has done to manifest that along the Monterey Corridor becomes a very important connection for us and we believe continues to build on what will make that area of San Jose become more and more vibrant. Thank you for allowing us to participate in these discussions. We really look forward to continue partnership with you all. And I will now turn the presentation back over to Nathan. Thank you very much. Um, you know, the San Jose State South Campus is building on a significant sports and recreation hub already. And it was really the discussions at the working group that kind of clicked in for me just how significant these planned investments are and the impact it could have on driving additional economic activity in the city. So other um, exciting changes include, um, uh, excuse me, exciting anchors include Excite Ballpark, um, the Solar for America uh, Sharks Ice Facility, which of course is city owned, recently expanding to become the largest public ice rink west of the Mississippi. At full utilization, you'll see that attract up, you know, roughly 2 million visitors a year, um, up from 1.2 million before the expansion as it brings in more fans and more events. Additionally, we cannot forget the Santa Clara County Fairgrounds, which is exploring plans that could bring in um, additional imp improvements and more visitors on more days. Some of these changes are already occurring there, such as a summer concert series, which you can still catch every Wednesday through September 28th, by the way. Um, from an economic development standpoint, these kinds of investments bring in additional visitors to the area that spend dollars and also support the regional hospitality industry and can really drive um, continued improvements um, on the corridor itself. So I'm gonna hand it over now to Nora, who's gonna be providing some highlights on recommendations from the report. Thank you, Nathan. The group's uh, work culminated with a set of recommendations corresponding with each strategic direction. For promoting economic diversity, eight recommendations were developed. Uh, these include increasing engagement with business on the corridor, formalizing the existing volunteer business association, fostering retail opportunities, and supporting the growing sports and recreation cluster. DOT will design a quick build transit and safety improvements along Monterey Road, which will support welcoming and safer streets. Uh, it should be noted that some of the recommendations have an asterisk by it. While these items are already included in the department work plans, if focused and proactive implementation is desired, ad additional funding would be required. Next slide, please. The approach to catalyzing development opportunities includes facilitating developer interest to vacant and underutilized sites, promoting the opportunity zone, 
and to focus new densification of a mix of uses at the Capitol Caltrain station area. The planning process is currently underway with residents, businesses, and stakeholders. The plan will include a real estate analysis, uh, examine circulation and connectivity, urban design and public realm features, and locations for gathering spaces. Next slide, please. And finally, the third strategic direction is promoting livability and a sense of place. These recommendations direct programs and projects supportive of placemaking. Traditionally, the Monterey Corridor supports light and heavy industrial businesses mixed in with residential areas, strip centers, and light retail centers. Due to its uh, history as a corridor for transportation of goods and people, uh, the wide roadway and industrial elements of the corridor are fitting for businesses and efficient transport. To complete the planning, design, and environmental clearance for grade separations uh, and increasing safety and liability along the corridor is also a recommendation. Engaging neighbors and the business community to support blight reduction efforts and proactively seeking funding for tree planting, street improvements, murals, and wayfinding signage. Uh, will also enhance the corridor. Now I'm going to hand it over to Rosalind to conclude the presentation. Thank you, Nora. So obviously the working group process was um, a significant collaboration and we're very thankful for the leadership of council members Esparza and Jimenez. Uh, they are certainly big champions for the corridor. And we want to acknowledge the participation really from all of the working group members. There were lots of meetings and presentations, um, lots of discussions and healthy debates, um, all with the vision in mind. And we certainly appreciate their time and commitment. Um, and we especially want to thank uh, Lisa Weiss from the plant management uh, for graciously hosting us pre-pandemic um, for our meetings. Um, and certainly we want to thank all of the city staff um, who were tremendous resources throughout the process, doing research, conducting analyses, and presenting lots of material. Um, and I have to acknowledge there were lots of staff changes um, over the years, and I certainly want to acknowledge former deputy city managers, Jim Ortball and Kim Wallish, who actually initiated their, uh, this effort and provided tremendous guidance to all of the staff. And lastly, I want to thank uh, Sarah Zarate uh, in the city manager's office. Sarah previously served um, as the lead staff co coordinator uh, among all of the city departments. And so with that, mayor and council, thank you for your indulgence. I know the presentation was pretty extensive. Um, our staff recommendation to you is that you accept the Monterey Corridor Working Group Report and also direct staff to return to the city council uh, with an update in six months. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you, Mayor, back to you. Thank you, Rosalind. Thanks for all your work uh, and, and that of the entire working group, uh, certainly on the city team, uh, Nora and Nathan, uh, as well as uh, Tracy and Kristen. And I think joining us, Jill, um, thank you everyone for your work and, and all the community members who participated in this process. Uh, let's go, uh, Councilmember Sparse, is it okay if we go to the public first? Let's do that. Claire Beacon. All right, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. To speak to surveillance and data collection technology and its accountability that seems will be a part of this project in some way. Uh, despite the good, sec uh, good sanctuary city laws that there can be in San Jose, we should be at a time the mayor, civic innovation, and city government staff need to learn to be more honest, straightforward, and clear how this data is being bundled and then sold to different commercial and law enforcement entities across the country and around the world. Government should learn to better trust what the everyday public can do with this sort of knowledge. The ideas uh, of good public Blair, Are you, now, I, think, I think you're- I'm coming in, in. I'm, bringing it, I'm bringing it in right now. Uh, uh, we're on the Monterey this. Corridor. Yes, I know. Uh, you're yeah. going to be using technology along the Monterey Corridor. Right. The ideas of good public oversight uh, open accountable policies and participatory democracy with data collection uh, uh, and overall uh, good uh, local neighborhood practices can help better address community cynicism, 
uh, fear and apathy and how to invite more people to help work towards a more sustainable community future this sort of commission is looking for. That's what I was trying to offer here. Sorry about that. It, it's good public practices. It's openness and accountability. That is what you're striving for. Uh, you're, you're striving for a better future of practices, inviting more people of the community to the process by open accountable technology practices and data collection practices. Uh, I feel I need to say that at this time as to help this process along as what can help this process. And it just, it needs to be included in the conversation. It, it, it can't be fully dismissed. I know it does seem a bit abstract, but if you think about it, it makes sense, I feel. Thank you. Back to the council. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Sparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so after so many years of work, I'm incredibly proud to have this report come to the city council for approval. There have been so many people and businesses, city departments and government agencies involved to develop this comprehensive report. Um, and, to, and, and I'll start by thanking the Monterey Corridor Working Group members. Uh, I'd like to thank our residents, Melissa Willette and Russell Failing, our local businesses, Granite Rock and Coastal Lumber, Home First, the Mechanical, Electrical, Plumbing and Fire Sprinkler Unions, Jill Rodby from Sims and the Monterey Corridor Business Association, the Fairgrounds Management Corporation, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and Kristen Brown, thank you for your partnership, the plant and VTA. Kicking off the working group in 2019, we hit the ground running, but the pandemic caused delays as staff was reassigned and working group members remained committed as we restarted the meetings earlier this year. Um, and I'd like to, before I give a thank you to staff, I'd actually, I'd like to thank the mayor. Um, we had some conversations about this um, and what people don't realize the first week of 2019, he actually uh, created the Monterey Corridor Working Group. And we had some conversations. Uh, I don't even think I had furniture in my office, <laughs> but he was checking in like, okay, how, how should we do this? Um, and he really immediately saw and supported the vision for a redefined, re-energized Monterey Corridor when he established this working group. And I'd also like to thank him for supporting several budget documents throughout the pandemic uh, to keep this work ongoing, such as the banners, such as the Silicon Valley Leadership Group one-stop website and many other things so that we could, even though there was a pandemic going on, keep this vision moving forward. So thank you, Mayor. Um, and this multi-department effort took a great deal of coordination to develop a comprehensive report. It's a list, but this is a labor of love um, for, our, so please bear with me. Um, I'd like to thank Rosalind Huey, Jim Orpal, Angel Rios, Kim Wallace, Sarah Zarate, Nora Chin, uh, Nancy Klein, Blage Zelich, Nate Donato Weinstein, Gay Yilmaz, Jackie Morales Ferrand, Reagan Henninger, John Cicerelli, Andrea Flores Shelton, Olympia Williams, Chris Burton, Michael Brio, Jared Hart, Charla Gomez, Matthew Benjamin, John Ristow, Jessica Zenk, and Brian Stanky. And I'd like to thank our partner agencies, VTA, Caltrain, Santa Clara County, High Speed Rail, and Santa Clara County Department of Roads and Airports. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Councilmember Jimenez uh, for his work serving on this working group. The Monterey Corridor is the southern gateway to San Jose and one of the city's main industrial areas in the city. It has had challenges uh, over the years, challenges that were created through lack of investment privately and publicly, but it's been an incredible opportunity to grow as an economic hub for this city and provide more jobs. You might have seen the cherries on the banners and in the presentation. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, there were orchards uh, and uh, Frontier Village, as I'm sure Councilmember Jimenez will remember. Uh, and so we really wanted to develop the new vision for this corridor. Uh, what were the next iteration of jobs for the city, particularly middle income jobs for workers without a four year degree, um, 
And I'd really like to also thank MTC, which has made the Monterey Corridor a priority for job production in the Bay Area. So now it's time to seize this opportunity. We've seen unprecedented investment, not only in the city, county, VTA, and Caltrain, but also our private partners, whether it's Granite Rock, WSS, and hotels, to investments like Sharks Ice, San Jose State, and the fairgrounds. As these investments continue, we'll see more and more dominoes fall that will uplift the corridor and the city as one of its economic hubs. As we continue to implement recommendations from this report over the next several years, you'll see a transformation of an area that was underinvested and neglected to an area that's a wonderful mix of critically important industrial businesses, improved commercial businesses, additional residential areas with the Capital Station Area Plan, and a sports and recreation area that is unlike anywhere else. And just as important, the commitment by VTA, Caltrain, Santa Clara County Roads and Airports, and the city, we're seeing investment in our transportation system to handle these proposed developments and encourage more investments from our private partners. This includes increased bus services, increased train services, and improving our roadways. The city and VTA are currently conducting a community-based transportation plan to bring additional improvements to Monterey Road and major connecting streets. Lastly, it includes high-speed rail running along the Monterey Corridor. I'm so proud of the work of this working group, and I'm excited for the future of Monterey Corridor, the southern gateway of San Jose. The residents of the Monterey Corridor, primarily our low-income communities of color, deserve this investment, the attention and focus by the city, our partner agencies, and private stakeholders. With that, I move to accept the Monterey Corridor Working Group report. Second. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership, uh, Councilmember Sparza, and your work on this. Uh, Councilmember Jimenez. Yeah, I think it's all been said. I just wanted to highlight uh, Councilmember Esparza's leadership, and, and you, Mayor, for making this possible. I, I She took the the lead on this, and, and quite frankly, I was following her lead most of the time. <laughs> I thought it was great work that was being done, and do, do think, uh, as she has uh, said on many occasions, the importance of Monterey Corridor. Uh, it really, I view it as the spine of the city, if you will. Um, there's a lot going on there, transportation, housing, businesses, industry. Um, and uh, and we even have high speed rail that's going to really really come down through the through the center of that. And so, um, yeah, I, I appreciate all the work from staff as well. I think uh, certainly it feels like forever that we've been meeting, <laughs> from those first meetings at the plant uh, to then going virtual. And and there was a pause there. And I was curious myself whether the work was going to continue. And certainly it did. And and so I just wanted to express my gratitude for everyone's work. I think everyone's been listed. Uh, but just wanted to say how very much I appreciate the effort and, and all the energy and time and, and money that has been spent on making this a reality. So, again, Councilmember Esparza, thank you so much for your leadership. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember. All right, other comments? I'll just, uh, my other colleagues won't weigh in. Let me just uh, add a couple thoughts. First, um, thank you again, Councilmember Esparza and everyone who worked so hard on this. Uh, you know, this is many ways this is the workhorse for the entire city this is uh where so much happens that's critically essential to us and yet i think through the decades uh few would disagree with the fact that we've underinvested in many of these neighborhoods along the monterey corridor and uh, many of those neighborhoods have some of our most vulnerable residents that deserve our greatest attention in addition there are extraordinary opportunities as well and i think we see that emerging uh, everything we hear about from San Jose State and the county, the fairgrounds, uh, and and all of the renewed interest in what's happening in industrial land over the last couple of years um, means great opportunities for us economically, as well as for recreation, uh, and a lot of other great things, certainly in transportation as well. So I, I really appreciate the work that's been done to help orient us in our efforts in the years ahead. Now the hard work is implementing, and I, that, that's exactly what awaits us. But uh, you got to plan first, and um, I know Eisenhower said, and I'm not going to say it as well, uh, that uh, <clears throat> that uh, every plan he ever went into war with, he uh, or he went into battle with, he threw out. But 
the planning was essential. And uh, he said it much more articulately. Uh, it's not so much having the plan, but it's doing the work of the planning that's so critical, uh, getting people in a room so we can focus on, on where we need to uh, spend our energy. I wanted to ask about one area in particular because um, I know there are, is a lot of activity going on at the county. We don't always see that clearly from our perspective because we're not in the middle of those conversations, but about everything that's happening at the fairgrounds, and obviously that can have an enormous, enormously positive impact on what's happening in the Monterey Corridor as well. And when I had the opportunity to go out there with uh, the county executive and, and some others, uh, oof, I don't know, probably two years ago, um, maybe a year and a half ago, so they were talking about some of their ambitious plans in partnership with the earthquakes and um, and uh, San Jose State and, uh, and others. There was some uh, concern about investing uh, city resources around infrastructure there. And I had suggested, hey, if there's an opportunity for perhaps tax increment financing to be used, maybe perhaps create an infrastructure financing district between the city and the county, we might be able to do something pretty remarkable together uh, if what you're looking for is sidewalks and parking and all those things that frankly are not there in that infrastructure. Um, and I just wanted to ask, has that conversation moved anywhere at this point or is the county or the county's plans on hold? You know, what, what do we think this, that the status of that situation is and is there an opportunity for the city to play a role in, in helping to make it work? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, certainly, um, there is a great need for infrastructure improvements in many segments um, along the corridor, particularly the area uh, right around the fairgrounds itself. We have had initial conversations um, with the county um, about those possibilities. We're definitely interested. Uh, certainly, our goal is to get the infrastructure in, right, so that we have the facilities that the, the workers, the residents, the visitors are going to need in order to, to enjoy the future investments and facilities. So we are definitely interested and we'll continue those conversations with the county. Okay, happy to talk more offline. I understand there's a lot of moving parts here. All right, any other questions or comments? Nope, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Carlos? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Crosco? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Foley? Aye. Mahan? Yes. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. I have doors opening. So, Arenas? Yes. Carrasco? Got it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, everybody. Now we're on to item 3.5, which is the digital privacy program update and public camera use. And we do have a presentation. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo, council members, members of the public. My name is Khaled Topic, Chief Information Officer. I'm also here with Albert Gahami, Digital Privacy Officer, Ed Schroeder, Deputy Chief of Police, Frank Karuba, Division Manager, Office of the Chief Crime Data Intelligence Center, San Jose Police Department, 
We also have Josh uh, Thomas from Flock, the vendor that provides the service. And Julie Tirico from Public Safety. We are here to update you on our efforts to advance the use of intelligent devices in the city and enhance the data usage protocol to preserve the privacy of our residents. Our presentation will focus on work, our work with the police department regarding the automated license plate reader. We also have staff available from the transportation and PRNS departments to answer questions. In February and March of this year, staff provided an, updated, uh, an update on the digital privacy program to the Smart Cities and Services Improvement Committee and the Public Safety, Finance, and Strategic Support Committee. Staff received feedback to find the right balance of ensuring privacy as we continue to innovate and utilize intelligent sensing devices. We received encouragement to use innovative and intelligent solutions to promote, promote safety in all communities. Staff engaged the community and privacy experts to solicit feedback to help in developing and updating the data usage protocols, including the automated license plate reader cameras. We will continue our journey in public engagement and improvement process to ensure transparency, innovation, and advanced privacy policy. I will now turn it over to Albert, who will share our progress since the last update in March. Thank you, Khalid. Thank you, members of council, mayor, members of the public. Since March, city staff and sorry, Albert Gahami, digital privacy officer. Since March, city staff across several departments have worked together to revise how the city will use automated license plate reader cameras. And we are bringing our residents and privacy experts along to make sure that we are designing the most effective and responsible usage policy we can. We have drafted that update to data usage protocol in coordination with police department. We've installed the first pilot cameras, the stationary pilot cameras at Monterey and Kirtner. We've held a webinar. We've done in-person outreach. We've engaged people online. We've uh, fielded news questions, and we have convened with our task force on detailed issues several times. And the reason why we have done all this, what we've experienced is what we call going from how, why to how. By engaging our residents and our privacy experts and learning to define the best usage protocol we can, we've built trust between us and our residents and at the end of each and every one of our in-person outreach meetings, we had residents asking us, how can we request these? We'd like them installed here, here, and here. And that type of invaluable information is something that we got because of the engagement and information that we provided. The alternative to this, and something that none of us want, is innovation that feels like it puts technology in front of people. I, one example, the smart city partnership between the city of Toronto and Google-owned Sidewalk Labs saw failure largely because residents didn't trust the technology in it. A large smart city project that, according to MIT, failed because of a lack of seriousness about the privacy concerns between them and the Torontons. And this is why with us in the city and why we've built out this program, security and privacy are able to enable responsible and effective innovation. From the privacy perspective, that puts us at our mission so that the data that we collect is used to support our communities. Residents understand what is being collected, why, and how to engage so that the city's innovation can benefit everyone. If we look at the privacy program at a glance, over the past year, we've reached over 1,000 residents through in-person and online avenues. We've reviewed over 100 projects to make sure that they are in compliance with our digital privacy policy. Of course, we are just looking at one project here, but there are many, many others that we are reviewing to make sure the usage is responsible and effective. And we are reaching residents and city staff through citywide privacy education to make sure that all of our city staff understand how to process and handle sensitive information. 
in the memo that we've presented to council today, we bring up three key examples of using our digital privacy program to ensure responsible and effective data usage. For the sake of time, we are focusing just on one example, San Jose's police department's work on the automated license plate reader cameras. To explain to people what these are, automated license plate reader cameras are cameras that take pictures, the backs of light of vehicles to read the license plate, check if that vehicle's license plate is reported as stolen, part of an Amber Alert, or any other ongoing criminal investigation lists. This supports the police department in investigations and potentially in some deterrence of crime, ultimately to produce safer communities. And I'm going to pass it off to Deputy Chief Schroeder and Frank Gruba to provide some of the success stories that we've seen already in the Monterey and Kurtner pilot. Hello, Council. My name is Frank Caruba. I am the Division Manager of the San Jose Police Department's Crime Data Intelligence Center, um, member of the public, um, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in June of 2022, uh, a suspect murdered a person in San Jose, um, had a woman and two young children in his car and fled to the Central Valley where he committed another murder. Through an interagency sharing of uh, ALPR data, uh, the suspect was tracked and located by the police department detectives uh, via the flock user interface as he drove back to San Jose from Gilroy. Um, this collaboration was made possible by the installation, training, and functionality of the pedestrian safety pilot in Monterey and Kurtner. In July of 2022, the Gilroy Police Department solved um, an armed bank robbery using the flock system. Uh, turns out that the uh, ALPR system used by the Gilroy Police Department uh, was connected to a number of robberies that had been uh, under investigation in San Jose over a year. Um, the system allowed uh, the Gilroy Police Department to identify a common car following stolen vehicles after the robberies, which led to the identification of a suspect, something that would have been impossible uh, without the technology. In August of 2022, a vehicle associated with a felony shooting passed through the Monterey Curtin intersection. Police Department, San Jose Police Department marked patrol units were in the immediate area and received an alert from the ALPR system in their patrol cars. And patrol officers immediately located the suspect's vehicle, confirmed that the plate matched the felony alert, and conducted a car stop. That stop led to the positive identification and arrest of the shooting suspect. Also in August of 2022, a vehicle associated with an armed robbery was located by detectives using the FLOC system. The FLOC system, the LPR system, identified the vehicle at the intersection of Curtin Avenue in Monterey, and um, arrest warrants were obtained for a number of suspects for armed robbery. And then lastly, just on September 13th of 2022 in Gilroy, um, officers responded to the call of a 92-year-old gentleman that was struck and killed by a vehicle in a hit and run accident uh, at one of the intersection of First Street and Wren Avenue. Um, they had very little information to go on, just the, a very cursory description of the vehicle. However, using their flock ALPR system, they were able to identify and ultimately arrest a 16 year old male uh, that was identified as the driver of the vehicle that struck and killed a 92 year old gentleman. Those are just some uh, of our many success stories that we've had in the very short time that we've had the ALPR system, the fixed ALPR system in the city of San Jose. Thank you, Frank. And while all of that uh, effective pilot was going on, we worked together to put together a robust policy to cover past, present, and future ALPR. As Frank mentioned, this is our first stationary automated license plate readers, but we've been using automated license plate readers for over a decade now. And we are taking the existing policy that was approved by council in 2017 and updating it to make sure that it follows not only our city's approach to privacy, but all compliance of state, local laws, and our digital privacy policy. We engaged residents, our privacy task force ultimately to create this one-time policy to cover everything. That way, if we find that this is effective, we can expand quickly using the same policy. As I've said earlier, 
We've engaged residents across a variety of different venues. One thing that I do want to highlight is our in-person outreach where we worked with Project Hope from Parks Recreation and Neighborhood Services to reach the neighborhoods where, as police has noted in their public safety, strategic finance, and strategic support committee meeting, where they are looking to install the next wave of gunshot detection and automated license plate reader technology, we were able to reach those specific neighborhoods and provide outreach and engagement in those meetings. In those meetings and in the webinar that we provided, we tried to make things as clear as possible about how the city intends to use automated license plate readers and how not. What you see here is what we shared with the members of the public. Key point being the purpose is to ensure that law enforcement can do their work while at the same time we are ensuring protections are in place so that this technology can benefit all communities. We are not investigating immigration. We are not monitoring people engaging in, law, in lawful activity, including activities around family planning and gender confirmation. And from this share out, we've heard hundreds of questions from residents genuinely trying to understand this technology. We heard over 100 alone in the webinar we had on August 24th, many more throughout our in-person engagements. And the one thing that really we took away from this is that residents care about the technology in our city and they want to understand it. When we engage them today, we are building trust, we learn how to innovate together, and we are serving all of our residents better through our technology solutions. I want to give a major shout out to all of the people, city staff, external task force, and others that have supported and made this engagement and this learning process possible as we fleshed out a robust ALPR data usage policy. Across that includes city manager's office, police, information technology, Department of Transportation, Project Hope from Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services, who not only provided us um, avenues to reach residents of the public, but also supported us in translation and making sure that all of our documentation was accessible to our residents along with support, detailed support from our Privacy Advisory Task Force, staff support from our Privacy Working Group, and all of the neighborhood association meetings that invited us in to speak on these topics. Next steps, we will continue to create standards, policies, and practices around all of the technology that is critical for both a privacy perspective and a city's value perspective, supporting departments in their technology initiatives and engagements, and, of course, providing updates to committee and council as needed. Thank you so much for your time, and we are happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you, Albert. All right. Let's go to the public. Cecilia. Good afternoon. Thank you for hosting this um, this meeting and for sharing this information. Although very informative, um, I just want to express that um, we are. Uh, my name is Cecilia, and I work with Silicon Valley Debug. I'm a community organizer and also part of the Fire Coalition in Santa Clara County, which we are an organization. We're a group of organizations that support the immigrant community and the intersectionality with the criminal justice system. Um, I just wanna voice our concerns with this LPR reader technology. Kind of our main concern as um, noted in the letters that were already submitted by our partners at ACLU, um, Asian Law Alliance and other um, civil rights organizations. We are concerned with third data third party data sharing, which we don't know where our information at the end of the day um, gets congregated and then sold. We know of different, different companies that sell this data to ICE, even though um, the representative right now mentioned that this is not gonna be used for immigration purposes. At the end of the day, we don't know where this data ends up. And we just wanted to voice that concern to uh, the council to take that into consideration. Although it does seem that you guys already made up your mind. Just wanted to voice that. Thank you. 
Victor. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Victor Sin, Chair of the Santa Clara Valley Chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. On behalf of several community organizations, I submitted a letter yesterday to express strong opposition to the deployment of ALPR. There are also specific concerns of the data usage protocol. The DUP should specify the scenarios in which third-party centers should be allowed to access the data, much less utilize the data. We question why third-party centers would need to use the data and are concerned about personal data being assessed and used by more people and institutions. Usage of ALPR systems for low-level non-violence incidents like traffic infractions only opens small community members to further reaching government surveillance. We caution the city to consider how using these systems for low-level issues can have unintended and disproportionate impacts on communities that are already over-policed. While we recognize that the DUP does not mention sharing data with out-of-state agencies, explicit language prohibiting sharing with federal or out-of-state government agencies should be included to fully comply with SB 34. We strongly urge the city to limit the sharing of ALPR data. The policy should prohibit the sharing of ALPR data with California agencies unless they agree to prohibit further sharing with out-of-state and federal agencies. Law enforcement should be prohibited from sharing ALPR data with any law enforcement agency for purposes of enforcing prohibitions on reproductive or gender-affirming care. Usage of ALPR systems should be prohibited in the investigation of low-level offenses such as minor drug offenses, prostitution, loitering, and graffiti. We continue to urge the city to shorten the data retention period. Finally, the audit logs should be available to any individual charged with a crime as a result of ALPR usage. Thank you. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, I hope you can real, really see a, a pretty strong connection between this item and the previous item and why I spoke uh, how I did on the previous item. Uh, I think there was an appropriate to it, to it that I hope can be respected. As we're talking about this item, uh, first uh, a thank you as I've been trying to offer recently since June, the mayor has opened up uh, ideas of the future of uh, racial equity and data collection questions. He's having this sort of item on today's agenda as other items. Uh, he's making an effort to, uh, or city, uh, San Jose is making an effort towards to ask the question of the community, you know, what is openness? What is, what it, how can we do these new practices better? And I, I think, I hope that you can see that your faults at this time, and, and that if we point out your faults, you're willing to work to want to correct them. I think you're having a really hard time to describe the, the bundling of data and how that is being uh, basically sold across the country through private corporations and to law enforcement. It's this third party default system that is how uh, ICE is getting, uh, you know, uh, surveillance. Uh, things and that we're worried about. And you're not addressing that honestly here. You, you had a nice, good uh, public meeting session process, but you, you're a bit too uh, timid to talk about that more openly and honestly with the public. I hope you can work on that issue and to honestly talk about how many stationary AOPRs you have possibly. I know the police department had at least 50 in 2018, I hope you can learn how to talk about that sort of issue more clearly as you're building a ton of street like technology and surveillance technology that can support ALPR use. How do, how do you talk about those things openly with the public? And we can be clear. Good luck on our efforts, what we do this fall. Thank you. Masheka, all good? Hello, um, the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet provided a memo that we hope each of the city council members is able to read. In summary, we need to be clear that the city is a consumer of the data produced by Flock. The city does not control the cameras. They don't control what is captured, collected, or when or how it is deleted. Flock owns the cameras. They own the data centers where the data is stored. They own the algorithms that determine what data is produced to the city. They own the encryption algorithms that determine the safety and privacy of the data that is produced to the city, and they ultimately determine what data to give to the city. The city has no ability to control or review the raw data. They only see what Flock provides them. There is no data usage policy for how Flock handles our data, and there are no safeguards in the contract 
that protects citizens from mistakes or even blatant abuses by flock or their employees. They can change the rules at any time and there's nothing the city can do because the contract doesn't have any requirements. The city is working very hard to ensure that we citizens trust the city with AOPR information. But who is working to make sure that we entrust or, or that we can trust FLOC? Thank you. Roxana Marachi. Thank you. My name is Dr. Roxana Marashi. I'm a professor of education and a data privacy researcher at San Jose State University, speaking as a private citizen, not as a representative of my employer. I had served for four years on the Digital Privacy Advisory Task Force for the City of San Jose as an invited member on behalf of the San Jose Silicon Valley NAACP. I resigned this past May from the city's task force in part because of the backwards process in vetting high risk privacy projects. The Flock ALPR pilot at Monterey and Kartner was rush approved by the city council prior to our having been informed of the vendor or having had the chance to vet the contracts or practices for data or privacy harms. This past March, the ACLU published a report titled Fast Growing Company Flock is Building a New AI Driven Mass Surveillance System, end quote, documenting a host of privacy and data vulnerabilities and problems with these new systems. Reporters in cities like Urbana, also subject to flock deployments, have doc documented contradicting claims regarding data ownership, first with promises that the city, PD, owns the data, and then with subsequent claims that, quote, the ALPR database is not in the possession of the city, end quote. What will the city of San Jose do to prevent similar contradictions and claims about data ownership? I urge you to recognize the numerous promises that made in both the flock contract and data use policy cannot and will not be upheld should the company be bought or sold to other owners or investors, a practice that is exceedingly common in the Silicon Valley tech sector. I share the numerous concerns raised in addition to the uh, by coalition members. In addition to these recommendations, I'd like to further request that the city council conduct a thorough vetting of conflicts of interest among members of the Innovation and Technology Advisory Board of City of San Jose. Currently, representatives from two venture capital investment firms have seats on the advisory board that would appear to give them a role in advocating for contracts and also benefiting these their investments. Andreessen Horowitz is an investor in the flock cameras. Bain and Company also has contracts with the um, po predictive policing. I'd like to request an additional minute, um, respectfully. Um, the city's- I'm Sorry, everyone gets the same amount of time. Paul Soto. Yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Predictive policing, uh, Captain Jason Dwyer one time stated at a PISPIS meeting that he can sit there at his computer and predict where crime is gonna be committed and then send resources to that area. Now, if you really listen closely to what he's saying, a crime has not been committed. The Constitution's basis is that in order for law enforcement to go anywhere near a citizen, that the citizen had to have done something first in order to activate law enforcement. This is basic, this is basic constitutional law, is that in order for there to be any kind of suspicion that any kind of crime has been committed, an act had to be done. You can't predict using your technology, your AI technologies by aggregating data that you've accumulated on people and then make these threat assessments to determine who's a threat and who's not. And that's what the city is doing. That's dangerous. That's why I don't trust my government. I don't trust the San Jose government. I don't trust the San Jose Police Department. I certainly don't trust Google because what you're doing is you're creating this society and the system, okay, to get people acclimated to being watched and that their information is aggregated. And then somebody's AI computer is making an assessment on that and you're not being honest with the people about it. That's going to that's gonna call your integrity as a government to govern into question. So you need to be real careful as to how you get this data, how you aggregate it, how you apply it, and then how you use it to police the people because who's policing you? Back to the council. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the council. Uh, council Mayor Menes? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll first move uh, the memo that you put out and thank accept you, the report. Yeah, I appreciate the comments in there. I just had a few questions, um, and uh, but also uh, I guess wanted to start by asking if 
Do you need a second? I'll second it. Yeah, sorry. Oh, that's a good point. I should have slowed down. We'll, we'll use Thanks that. for hitting the brakes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, just so excited about this topic. It's just so fascinating. Um, it, what I was curious about is if any uh, any members of the team had a chance to read the letter by some of the entities that uh, sent the letter. I think it was uh, ACLU, Black Kitchen Cabinet, and a host of other folks. And, and, and if so, if if want to offer a response, or certainly I know it's maybe about three or four pages long, but I was curious if. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councilmember Jimenez. We've all had an opportunity to read the memo and uh, read the letters that were attached. Um, some of the, the comments and, and concerns have been expressed before and addressed before. Um, one thing I would like to say and, and, um, is that in, in the second letter that was attached as an exhibit, there was a lot of mention about video surveillance. And um, the ALPR technology we're talking about today does not employ any video surveillance. Uh, it mentioned um, tracking people as they walk through intersections, and this technology doesn't have that capability. Um, the technology, as uh, Albert Kahami described, merely takes a photograph of the back of a vehicle and concentrating on the license plate for that license plate number, which is designed to be placed on a car for a purpose, and that is to identify the vehicle. Um, it can be identified as being in a location at a certain time. And uh, some of the success stories that I mentioned earlier, obviously, were able to capitalize on that uh, technology. Um, so th that's, and there's no uh, personal identifying information associated with the, the technology. It doesn't um, run anything against a computer database, a DMV database. Police have to still do their job just like they would ordinarily after receiving a hit. So I, I would like to make a comment on that and just kind of clarify that this technology does not work that way. Okay. And then, I don't know if you want to. Just to build briefly off of what Frank said. Every time, and this is one of the concerns that we heard both from the letters and from others around who can access the data, how do we know if people are going to access the data, who can, who can see it, all of those things. I want to make clear that every time that any officer, and it's only officers that are trained to use this technology, can access the information, any time that they access it, that is logged. They have to provide a purpose, which in this case is like a case number. And it's going to give their badge. It's going to provide all of that information so that afterwards we can audit and make sure that that log shows us exactly how the technology is being used. And that doesn't just go for us. The only other people that have access to the data are the law enforcement, the neighboring law enforcement agencies that we agree to share this information with to support coordinated efforts across cities. At the same time, if they ever access any of our uh, information, they also get logged. All of that information is tracked so that we can make sure that any time our information is used, we know exactly how it's being used by who. Okay, I appreciate it. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Member, Mayor, members of the public. My name is Ed Schroeder. I'm a Deputy Chief of the San Jose Police Department. A couple other things I think that need to just come out as, as point so everyone understands what we're talking about is I hear I hear um, concerns about sharing or selling, not sharing, but selling the information. Strictly prohibited for us to do. We don't do it. The, the company will not do that. Um, I, I want everyone just to think of these cameras as reliable witnesses. The best way we could describe it. Um, they act as our eyes or the public's eyes when nobody's there to actually see what happened. And they, they provide us with a tool. They are a tool. They provide us with a starting point, whereas at times when we would have no starting point, we, um, we, didn't, we now have one to work with. So I think that's actually very important to mention. And this got mentioned as well, but um, I want to make sure it wasn't lost. Frank had mentioned these are not video clips. These are still photographs. The only thing that's, that's distributed, the only thing that's, that's saved and actually visible to anybody who looks at it is the actual license plate, the same license plate you would see if you're standing on that street corner and you're watching cars go by. Okay, thank you. And, and then I, so t to that point, I guess one of the things I was curious about is, so so these are cameras pointing at license plate, right? I mean, it's inevitable that there's going to be people walking by and pedestrians sort of crossing the street. Those images are not captured? No, they're not. Okay. Um, so the way the system works is is the, the vendor comes out and, and trains the, lice, the, uh, the readers um, on lanes of traffic. Um, they are 
uh, strategically placed in ways where they can capture the largest amount of traffic traveling through the intersection. Um, they're typically pointed at the rear of the vehicle for many different reasons, but the primary reason is that most people never remove their rear license plate, but some people will remove the front license plate. Uh, so um, when you look at the images, what you will basically see is a picture of just the back end of the car. Now, th there is some technology employed that helps um, identify the license plate under low light conditions. So if you look at the nighttime photographs, you really can't really tell what the, what is going by other than you see taillights um, and the license plate lights it, itself, but you can't see inside the car. Um, you, you can see distinguishing characteristics of the back of the vehicle. For example, if there was a, a luggage rack or maybe a bumper sticker, you could see that. And actually in one of the examples that I used, uh, there was damage to the vehicle and our uh, detectives uh, did a great job of using the still images to look for the damage in the vehicle and were able to identify the vehicle based upon that damage. So the vehicle itself is the only thing that's being identified, not anyone that's associated with the vehicle. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think there's a few layers to this, and and I would just say to you, just so my view generally of the topic is, is that I think these cameras have some value, and I think there's some value, obviously, in the police department having that information. Uh, I think uh, where my concern resides is more with some of the folks, really, some of the concerns that have been expressed, and and I often hear it necess not necessarily tied to, well, what does the police department do with the information? What is the city doing? Because there, there's some semblance of oversight here. <laughs> um, but uh, oftentimes, the other layer that I, that I, from what I could gather, is what is Flock doing with the information? Um, and so I think it, Flock, and I would say Flock is obviously the one that we have a pilot with currently. I think there's four, four or five, or maybe nine cameras. I'm trying to remember. We, the we have uh, one pilot that's installed at the four cameras at right. Monterey and then one in the works. Correct. So, so, so I think uh, they're the one, I mentioned their names because I think that's what's come up simply because we have that. But I think in the future, we're going to be going out for an RFP for about 90 cameras citywide. Is that? It really or depends so? on the vendor and the okay. cost, but, right. um, you know, somewhere in that range. Okay. And I, and I think the focus is on flock now just simply because they're the ones with the contract. And so, um, can, can someone help me understand what the business model of an organization or a company like Flock or any other vendor that may seek to, to get, you know, a contract with the city? H how do they make money? What, what is it that they do? We actually have a representative um, on the uh, Zoom call cool. from, from Flock. Um, his name is Josh Thomas. Uh, yeah, I'd like to he hear He might from be the him. best person to answer that question. Yeah, please. Hey, my name is Josh. Thanks for letting me speak on this issue. Yeah, our business model is pretty simple. Uh, we charge a sus subscription access to the devices themselves. So it's $2,500 per camera per year for the devices. And the city owns all of the data from those devices. So we go out and install them, we maintain them. That's how we make money from these is through uh, the hardware themselves. Um, and as long as you're under contract, you get access to all the data. Um, and in reference to something that someone asked earlier, uh, we can't access the data. We don't have access to it. Only the city or the representatives from the law enforcement agency have any access to that data. Okay, thank you. And just, uh, I'll just very ask the question very directly. Does Flock make any, money, money, make any money selling any of the images or information captured by the cameras? Absolutely not, no. We do not share or sell with any third parties. We contractually are not allowed to do that, and we never have and we have no plans to ever do that in the future. Okay, all right, thank you, sir. Uh, the, the other question I had has to do with the fact that, so, so we're moving forward with these data usage protocols as, as it relates to the AOPR systems that may come in the future and the ones that exist now. Given that the current pilot with Flock was signed, I think in uh, May or March, I'm trying to remember the exact, it started with an M. <laughs> what month was that? <laughs> It goes about about a year. If I, if I could, for the pedestrian safety pilot? Yeah, correct. So, yeah, so the um, it was proposed in September of 21, installed in May of, okay, of sorry, this year. Okay, sorry, that's what I was thinking. And so given that the protocol is coming into, you know, taking shape or we're approving this now, how do we make sure that the contract that Flock has with the city already in the pilot is fashioned in a way that it incorporates some of what we're expressing here in the data usage protocol? Thank you, Council Member. Again, Albert Gahami, Digital Privacy Officer. And I can 
answer that from two different angles. So first and foremost, going back to what we heard, and if you look in the agreement that we have with Flock, we own all of the data. And when I say that, I mean, we are the only ones that can access and view the data. Otherwise, it's encrypted. You can't make sense of any of the information otherwise. That means that how we choose to use it, who we choose to share it with, we are the only entity that actually can use it. Now, on top of that, though, you have concerns, understandable concerns around cybersecurity, making sure that they are following the protocol. And that is why for all future contracts, we are baking in the data use protocol, making sure that that information is in there. And we just recently worked with Flock to make sure that this is also included in the purchase order for this pilot. Okay, all right, it makes sense. And so, and so just to wrap my head around how this is gonna work. So we have the data, data usage protocol, right? That it's being passed, it's a policy. Uh, we're going out to RFP, some, maybe it's already happening, but sometime in the near future for additional cameras, additional ALP, or ALPR systems with maybe Flock or other type, similar type of vendors, right? And so uh, when, when say Flock or whatever vendor X, Y, and Z gets selected, uh, we would then sort of at some point hand that off to the city attorney's office, they would use the data usage protocol to then fashion language that would go then get built into the contract with these individual folks? Is that? Uh, yes, that's correct. Well, one thing I want to add, as we learn about the usage and the protocols, we continue to enhance the language we want to put in the contract and also the policy. That's why we're coming today to change the policy that existed before. Uh, so this is really the opportunity for us to learn, adjust, and make it better for the next one. So that's really the plan. As we as we release the next RFP, we want to make sure that the language that we have to address some of the misunderstandings that we heard today from from the public, and make sure that there is clear language in the contract that doesn't uh, give misunderstanding or misinterpretation of what, who owns the data, who can sell the data, who who can grant access to the data, and all this information. So that's something that we we gain as we as we hear from the public, as we meet from comments like this. To make sure that we have the, the strong, clear language to, uh, to communicate clearly that uh, the city is in control of the data and the access. Okay, thank you. And Nora, can I just ask, it, it, when the city attorney's office is, is, is drafting up, uh, you know, the, all the related lingual language as it relates to some of these contracts, is it just simple contract sort of law language that's, impl that, that's utilize or, or are there do you have folks in your office lawyers that are trained i don't know if there's a specific slice of legal work related to tech related projects and such or there are some lawyers in my office who are more familiar with technology issues than others um, we also uh, have a number of reviews we uh, reach out to other um, cities and other sources for language and information. Um, at times, the contracts are coming from vendors uh, with standard language that we're reviewing and and uh, comparing and that kind of thing. Okay, and and then I imagine in cases where Flock or any other vendor sends language to your office to the city, your office gets it. I, I, I'm assuming in most circumstances, language is favorable to the <laughs> company, and then you all sort of devise and, and draft something else that then hopefully is agreed upon and it brings everyone together, is that? There often is a negotiation process, and um, I think there are times when our office is considered too um, strict about language, <laughs> um, but we we work our way through those issues. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. And I'll just end by saying, I, you all presented at PizFiz, I think it was last week. I told you I was gonna submit some questions. I didn't submit the questions, there is no memo for me. The reason for that is that I, I determined that a lot of those questions were specific to the flock contract, even though flock contract was mentioned. I just didn't know if it necessarily was applicable to what we're discussing, but I think it's uh, it potentially be informative in the future as to maybe some of the questions that can be utilized to, to best fashion a contract that's best for the city. So. Thank you for all the work, I appreciate it. Thank you, <clears throat> Council Member John. Uh, yeah, thank you. And j just one last follow-up on that line of questioning related to the data ownership. Um, 
obviously we own the data, we have access, it's encrypted with us. Where is it stored? Is it stored on, a, on the cloud? Is it, is it on their servers? Is it on city servers? Where's the data stored? Thank you, council member. The data functionally is on vendor cloud. I'm happy to provide you more details uh, privately, but you know, for the sake of cybersecurity, yeah. it's stored vendor cloud. Okay. Um, encrypted. It was just for my information. I want to understand that a little bit better for, for how data flows, but I understand it's encrypted and we only, we're the only ones with access to the data through contract. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, this, this item is multiple, multi-pronged. I mean, obviously we're focusing on ALPRs. To me, that's actually very simple technology that doesn't really give us much information that can be abused based on what you were saying. Similar to the PRNS contract. I mean, it's taking pictures of cars coming and going and, and I, doing a count and immediately deleting the data as far as I understand it. Is that correct? So there's not even any, any retention there at all? Correct. It is a people counter. Basically, it yeah. counts the number of people that come across. Yeah, so that's, and, and just back to the first one, the ALPR, that data, there is a retention timeline, time limit. How long is the data retained? The retention period as it stands in the protocol is one year. And this is what we were advised by our legal team, both from police and from information technology uh, due to California government code 34090, mm -hmm. which is basically just the standard retention. Right, and we need to retain it for some period of time so we can actually use it to go back and look for, for things. Okay, and then the third one, that's the one I wanna ask a little bit more about, the DOT one. That one seems to me to get more information. It uses video, um, and I wanna understand a little better how that's used. It talked about counts at intersections, but in addition to that, using AI to, to find, look for dangerous situations. And I think that's helpful, obviously, to the DOT for um, being able to, to go and figure out what intersections need attention, where do we need to do further study. Um, can, do we have some information about how that works and what is retained and... and... Yeah, so um, Ho Nguyen has come to uh, present for uh, DOT and answer some of those questions. Uh, yeah, go for it. Hi, so uh, I'm Ho Win. I am the ICS manager with the Department of Transportation. So the device is used to capture safety metrics. So you're right, it does use artificial intelligence. And with video, it will analyze um, video and it will look at everything from speeding, uh, red light running, things like that. And it will capture the actual data. It doesn't store images, things like that. So it just extract the data. And then we store the data up to a year, right? And that's it. I thought I read that it said there was three second video clips that are stored if there's so incidents the that are. That's right. So we do have, have the option to turn that on, but we just don't do it now. But, oh, okay. Because yeah. I was just wondering, so the, the idea here is that if that you might want to identify dangerous intersections and where there might be near misses or other things. So yeah, the AI, right. is it telling us, for example, a vehicle almost hit a person or there were two cars that came too close together and we're getting a count of that occurrence? And, but we're not necessarily going back, have, we don't have video to go back and look at it again to see what really happened? So we are looking at, so we are looking at, that, at that particular feature to see if, it makes, uh, if it's uh, usable. So I'm working with Albert to see, you know, to uh, use that portion of the uh, unit. And you're right, it does have the option to take um, three second snapshots. And then we do use that, and we're currently looking at whether that's useful or not. Right now we're looking at that, we're looking at LiDAR, doing the same kind of metrics as well. Um, so we just installed it about a few months ago. So we're in the process of analyzing its value, to see if it's really useful or not. So, but we're not like turning, on, like turning it on full time and doing it like, uh, we don't have a timeline yet. So okay. we're just assessing the actual technology to see if it's useful. Yeah, it'll be interesting to learn more about that in the future as you, as you okay. study it more. I mean, it, I, clearly given our Vision Zero objective and also what I see as increasingly dangerous outcomes on our roads, being able to have a systems in certain key places to to help guide where we're going to, we should make improvements and what kind of improvements to make would be helpful if that's the kind sure. of thing we can and get. And that's the reason why we installed it at that intersection because this has a lot of accidents. Yeah, right. right. Okay. So right now it's just at one intersection and? Right now it's the only one, at one intersection. Part. And that is that another contract we're thinking of expanding to do multiple places or are we still just piloting that it's one for a while? It's a pure pilot. We don't have any intention to do mass installation elsewhere. And now I have just a couple of questions about the mayor's memo. Maybe that's not for you anymore <laughs> now, now for, for the mayor. Um, so I see for, on your third item, there's a lot of questions about um, studying and analysis of, the, of how effective this is, the effectiveness of these 
of these um, systems. I, I'm just curious, what, what is the success criteria you're looking for? Yeah. Because, you know, for example, we heard a couple of stories and to yeah. me, one, you know, one success is, a, is maybe enough, right, to, to justify. Yeah. So I'm just curious. Agreed. I, I, I'm satisfied LPRs are very useful because we've been using them for 16 years and I've heard those success stories many times. Uh, I think um, in the case we've had a pilot, for example, shot spotter, and with San Jose, uh, I think it's important for us to understand. I know there were some issues with the vendor, but I think it's important for us to transparently discuss what's working, what's not, so we can all learn from it as policymakers and also as, as implementers. So really what you're asking for is just to be able to have a conversation at some point on how well are these pilots working? Is that really the sort of Yeah, and it's probably not a bad idea for us to decide what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve and if there's some reasonable metric that captures that outcome in a meaningful way. Um, you know, was this used to actually help us arrest anybody or solve a crime or, uh, you know, prevent an accident? And that's more of a question of whether our money is being well spent also as, as much Absolutely. as anything else. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the second item B on that 3B, return to council with work plan for assessment of privacy risks. What is yeah. what is it that you're looking for there that's different than what we're talking about today? I, I, I guess it, it really goes to, let me be clear, um, we, we told as a council, we told staff, hey, go update this policy. <clears throat> so all this work that they've done is our fault. <laughs> we told them to go do that uh, and, and they did it. and. I'm grateful for all that work, but an enormous amount of work was invested in this. And, and I think, frankly, too much, because I share your view that LPRs are pretty straightforward technology we've been using for 16 years and they're used in cities throughout the country. And no court has ever held that there's a reasonable expectation of privacy with LPRs. So if that's what the courts say about what the Constitution says about our privacy, then we should probably be moving on to those areas where there really is a serious privacy concern because there's a constitutional privacy right that is at risk. What, what we saw in, in this report was it evaluated LPRs explicitly as a high privacy risk. I would disagree with that. I think we've got a lot of other privacy risks we ought to be focused on. And this one doesn't rank anywhere in the top three or four in my mind. Uh, and so I think it's important for this to come back to the council for us to say, hey, look, here's what we think we really want to spend our time rather than spinning our wheels in areas where you know, frankly, every member of the public who's been through a parking garage or across a bridge has been subjected to an LPR. So this is probably not our top concern about privacy risk. Right. Yeah, I mean, to point out on LPR, I mean, when I go park at the airport parking garage, my parking ticket has my license plate number on it, right? So yeah. they, they're, they're recording that everywhere I go. Um, but just back to your, the, we, we've got now this policy in place, yeah. the privacy policy, staff's take it done the work, yeah, it's I'm not sure that the policy itself is impeding our use of the LPR. So I'm, you know, I just want to make sure we're not asking staff to go off and do additional work on, pri on privacy when we, we have a policy which I think makes sense and and is clear and everyone can understand it. And you know, being a little cautious so that the public is comfortable with what we're doing, to me, is not necessarily a problem. So I just want to. Yeah, I guess that. more than anything, you know, if it was inartfully stated in the memo, I guess maybe I better state it as, I think with regard to all the work we're going to do on privacy and technology, that probably should be part of a work plan that council has a chance to look at and say, we care a lot about this or we don't care about that. Okay, okay. I, I mean, I'm okay with that. I just, yeah. just, just sort of want to make sure we're not asking for some analysis or work that's you know going to be unnecessary. So no, I, I fully important. agree. I think we're aligned on that, which is exactly why I raised this issue, because I think a whole lot of work was done on this LPR okay. issue that probably was a bit excessive. And then on, on your first item about signage, I just want to ask questions about signage. So I saw on your, the graphic of a sign that's put up that says these, these are in use here. Your concern here is that we'd be giving away too much information or being, or being too, uh, you know, not being clear enough that they're also in use other way, in other ways. I want yeah, to I, I guess my first concern is that we're misleading people <laughs> because people assume if we're putting signage up, where we're using an LPR that's stationary, we must be putting signs up wherever we're using it, which is definitely not the case. Uh, we're using it all throughout the city, and it really is irrelevant to anyone's privacy interests, whether it's stationary or mobile, it's still recording exactly the same information. So if we're gonna be straight with our community, we should either decide we're gonna tell everybody that it could be used anywhere, um, or, or not bother with the signs. Um, and however we can efficiently do that, great. I just think we're, 
we're, we're burning, creating a lot more heat than light uh, in deciding we're going to put up the signs everywhere we might have a camera. So I think it, maybe it's maybe it's worth a discussion on how not to make people believe that it's the only place we're using them. But I do I see the benefit of the signs, particularly at intersections dangerous like Monterey and Kurtner. Even having the sign there that says to people, "If you do something here, it's going to be recorded," is actually an, another deterrent that provides a level of safety in my mind. So the sign to me adds is a is a multiple benefit. There's a, I, there's the issue of the issue of letting people know, but there's also it's also kind of a warning. You know, I, I would agree if we're using, for example, speed cameras in particular. I, I think that could be a great value and benefit. Um, I, I think there are some drawbacks, and I think, you know, San Jose PD may want to weigh in on this, uh, about what happens, some of, the, some of the drawbacks of actually identifying the location. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. <clears throat> so we, we actually had that concern, concern ourselves at the Police Department with putting signage up everywhere there's going to be camera clusters. Now, you're right, Council Member, it does make sense in areas where we're specifically concentrating on traffic and, tra and, and high probability intersections of accidents and, and, sec and parts of town where a lot of accidents have occurred, the signage may actually come in handy there, like you're saying, when someone sees it, they may slow down as a result. Um, there's, there's several different projects going on with our AL ALPR cameras and um, for ones that are not related to traffic, ones, for example, that are related, related more to high violence areas where we, um, where, you know, for the gunshot detection, for example, we think it actually would be um, counterproductive to have the signage everywhere the camera clusters are. And, and mainly because, um, you know, somebody who's looking to avoid an area and looking for an escape route outside of where cameras are at, will be able to navigate that based on the fact that we're telling them where all the cameras are at. So there's been some discussion, and I think I think there's some probably some halfway point in between. I mean, it, like I mentioned with the with the uh, the high probability areas of, of accidents, I think it makes sense. Um, outside of that, I think some of the major ingress um, roads into the city would make sense. And there also has been discussion about um, about potentially some utility building um, with respect to indicating um, that we use these cameras. Um, there's been pretty extensive um, community outreach as well that's been spearheaded by Albert. And, uh, and um, his office and, um, and, and in conjunction with the police department as well. So I think there's kind of a happy medium between the both, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's I, clearly worth continuing to assess what is the right approach for to make sure that sure. we're safe and we're not doing things that are going to, to provide, um, to telegraph to people who are trying to do, you know, get away from something where they should go, I get that. So anyway, I, I fully, I'm, I'm fine with that. I just want to make sure that we're also thinking about all of the, the benefits and drawbacks of the, of the of signage and, and warning. Okay, I'll support the motion. I just wanted to make sure that we don't, you know, spend over <laughs> overdo some of these conversations that may not may not be necessary. It was it was amusing to me when I was leaving the parking garage at the airport a couple of weeks ago and. I didn't have to put my card in to leave, and the thing just opened because it knew I had paid. And I thought, wait, wait a second, how come I didn't put my card in? I realize it's because they're using my license plate to let me in and out of the parking garage. So um, people don't even realize this is happening, and it's important for people to understand that your license plate is a public piece of information, not a private one. And, and if I could, council member, that happens in this garage here for this. Well, I, and I know it does here, but that, but, but this was different because I paid it for a ticket, and I thought I had to put my ticket in, and it didn't take it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Sparza. Thank you. Um, a good discussion. I, uh, I wanted to ask just again for the purposes of clarity to ask in plain English, does Flock have access to the names or addresses of the registered owners of the cars? No. Thank you. Um, and uh, I wanted to also um, bring up on the pilot for the gunshot technology. It's my understanding that that started, stopped, and it's going to restart again. So when that comes back, those lessons will be learned with us. Or will, the lessons learned will be shared with us. Is that correct? Yes, Council Member, thank you for the question. Um, yes, uh, those lessons are extremely important. It's the whole purpose of the pilot, uh, is to understand and appreciate whether that technology brings value uh, to both um, preventing uh, and deterring um, and investigating violent crime. So gunshot detection and um, gun violence is a big priority with the police department and the city. 
and it's what we want to focus on, so yes. Thank you. Um, and then I uh, wanted to address uh, something that the mayor included in his memo, uh, which I thought was very smart, which was in light of the Dobbs decision um, that we develop um, some protocols um, around sensitive uses, such as Planned Parenthood clinics, because we're seeing what's happening in other states. Not, um, and so who, who captures that? And from, we have two right now with soon to be a third, uh, or not soon, but at some point, hopefully, a third clinic and will be in District 7. Um, would we share that with IT, or who's going to track that? So the data is owned by the police department. It's not even uh, accessible by the vendor itself. Um, the <laughs> digital privacy officer will have um, access, and we will do an audit. Um, but that um, information will be used for legitimate police purposes only. And um, all officers and all users that have access to the system can be, can and will be and are tracked uh, when they're using it. Uh, they're all trained on prohibited uses, um, acceptable uses. Um, and actually the flock system, and I'll, I'll speak to that because we are piloting it right now, actually has a disclaimer built into it. You can't even access the system without agreeing to certain things. For example, uh, that you will not use any of the information obtained for any uh, immigration purposes. That's actually a, uh, a requirement that you check that box anytime you enter the search feature. And I'm not talking about just the first time you log in. I'm talking about every time you go back to the search feature from any other feature within the system, you have to agree to that. So there's all, all kinds of checks and balances built into the system that we're currently using. And those are the kinds of lessons that we want to learn from the pilot uh, as to whether or not this is the type of technology that brings not only the most value to us as a tool, but also protects the privacy of everybody that's impacted by it. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, uh, I wanted to thank uh, the city staff for their hard work on this, especially Khaled Tofik, Albert Gahami, um, and Ed Schroeder, and, uh, Assistant Chief Paul Joseph and the whole team from SJPD. Um, I know that our city staff has been working really hard and taking extra time to ensure that we are uh, on the cutting edge of implementing technology, uh, but doing that in a way that balances the need to provide services with the need to be mindful of our residents' digital privacy rights and concerns. I do think that these protocols um, strike that balance. Um, and I wanted to also uh, reiterate that ALPR technology is uh, not new technology. It's not new to our city. We've been using it since 2006, which the mayor mentioned. Uh, and it provides a critical life-saving tool to stop dangerous criminals while deterring further violence in our communities. This council voted to approve the cameras at Kirtner and Monterey to save lives. We were struggling with horrific traffic deaths and that compelled us to wisely, strategically make use of this technology. Um, I also wanted to address uh, the gunshot detection technology that we piloted as a city um, in, the, in Cadillac Winchester, which actually had uh, beat District 7 in terms of statistics, uh, unfortunately. Um, and uh, the Owsley neighborhoods, where drive-bys and other shootings have been a tragically common occurrence. And we need to do right by the communities that bear the brunt of this violence. And so, uh, so we owe our community that change. And I think that this technology provides a critical tool in our effort to combat the epidemic of traffic deaths, particularly hit and runs, that we have seen a rapid increase in the past few years. Um, so I'll be supporting the motion. Um, I think we've had, through the discussion here, um, good discussion about what is and is not being shared um, and what personal information is not being shared um, and that we have balanced, we provided that balance um, of protections with the need to protect our community. Thank you. 
Council Minister, as far as I feel I may uh, answer your, your last question, regarding any areas that you might think is sensitive, uh, we really appreciate you can share the application with us so we can keep track of it. You can send it to, to me or to the Deputy, uh, I mean the uh, Digital Privacy Officer, and we will keep track of this area just for future uh, purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this has been a really good conversation. I appreciate all of my colleagues' questions and, and comments of the, of the the public. I also want to thank, in addition to all the people that were just thankful, I want to thank Judy Tirico and Frank Caruba and, uh, and everyone who's been uh, working behind the scenes um, on all these technologies. Uh, they're really important for law enforcement, and we have to be really careful. And I think everybody is, is focused on those two goals, uh, being careful because uh, privacy does matter, uh, and it's very important to our residents. Um, so I, I didn't mean to be flippant by suggesting concern about how we're ranking privacy concerns, but I guess I'll re maybe here's where I'm going with this, because it's on pr page seven that staff concludes this is a high privacy risk. And I think about a lot of the kinds of privacy risks that are posed by the city's collection of data. Right? We, we have cameras at City Hall and at the arena, so we can tell who's showing up, right? We have. We collect financial information of all kinds from people um, through all kinds of mechanisms here at the city. Uh, you know, a, a police drone could capture images from inside a bedroom. Uh, we have, you know, there's concerns I know out there, and I don't know if it's true, but shot spotters could record private conversations by people who are within earshot. Or, uh, you know, we have video cameras for, I know was, since the time I was a prosecutor, we had video cameras in high crime parts of the city and other cities. And that doesn't just record a play, it records an actual person, a real image of a, of a human being. Um, and so I, I think about all those risks, and I'm wondering why did LPRs get ranked as a high priority when we got a lot of other things that I'm guessing most folks would say are a greater privacy concern, and certainly courts would say are a greater privacy concern. Absolutely, Mayor, and completely understand your concern. There's a few elements here, and forgive me, some of it might be a bit of a chicken and an egg scenario, but we have seen from the public concern and care and questions about this, and I think it goes to the point of we are looking at a large expansion. It's an exciting time, and it's an interesting time for us to provide and expand this technology, but it really is, in many regards, one of the first times that we're installing just a large number of cameras recording with the intention of law enforcement. I think about, and you know, to your point around monitoring um, facilities, uh, monitoring traffic, the vast majority of these cameras, they aren't, they're not recording anything, let alone being used for law enforcement purposes. And, and I, don't, I don't say to say that, you know, everything that touches something on the street should be going through this process. But yeah. It was certainly a first stint, and it caused, you know, for better or for worse, it caused a lot of concern. And by going through this process, and I hope that we can, and I'm more than happy to produce a report on the technologies that I think we should prioritize moving forward, right? There's, like you said, there are plenty of others that we should be focusing on. But by doing this, we have established a lot of things that are very valuable for the furthering of any technology that we do. One of those being the boilerplate data usage protocol language that we've put into place. I don't want to speak too soon, but we are working on the data usage protocol for gunshot detection right now, and basically everything that we learned from the ALPR, we can port right into there, and the process is much faster. That includes things like, how do we want to analyze the effectiveness of the technology and go back on it? We've established a lot of the avenues through which we can reach the residents that are being directly impacted by this. And both, you know, just to the points of making sure that staff has the avenues to reach out to residents, this has been incredibly valuable for that. Um, I, it's been so weird to have people reach out directly to an internal IT staff member to ask to present at their neighborhood association <laughs> meetings. But, it's, <laughs> but, it's, but it's, been, it's been incredible to be able to have that line of communication. And, I, I agree with you. I do not wish for our technology process, especially something like this, to take this long ever again. <laughs> okay. uh, but, but I, you Thank know, you. Seconds. Yeah, I think everyone, I think everyone <laughs> can yeah. second that. But, but I will say that the learnings that we have gotten from this, the connections we have made, and the, the 
bearings that we have put in place yeah. have made this a very fruitful endeavor for, for the process at large. I appreciate that. I appreciate there needs to be some foundational work that gets done. And hopefully maybe the path would be a little smoother going forward. Uh, that's a good thing. And, and look, I, I certainly don't blame anyone in the community for being concerned and flinching whenever there's discussion about the government collecting information about us. You know, it's a healthy reflex. We're Americans, that's what we do. We don't like government collecting information about us. Clint, I'm sorry, did you want? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm just gonna throw my two cents on this. I think people have a lot of misunderstanding about cameras because cameras can do whatever you tell the cameras to do. Right. So it could be facial recognition, could be other things. So I think the fear of the unknown it's people associate the ALPRs with other technologies that might not be associated or th these cameras capable of, but I think the confusion of what they can do or what cameras in general can do, it, it increases the risk and the misunderstanding and miscommunication in this area. Thank you, understood. Um, and since Facebook and TikTok know a lot more about any of us than the city of San Jose is ever going to know, um, I know we all have a lot of concerns on privacy. Um, one thing I would just throw out as a suggestion and just for, for thinking about, Alvarez, you're, and, and I didn't mean for us to go create this really lengthy process for you to come to the council. I, I think it's just important for you to say, hey, here are the top three things I'm concerned about on privacy and this is what we're gonna go look at. And so everybody can debate it and say, yeah, we agree or no, we think this is more important. Because I, I just, I'd hate to slow us down in some areas where, you know, frankly, like LPRs, it's, the concern isn't as great. Um, and, and I think one thing that might be helpful to just consider is maybe checking in with the city attorney about, look, where, does, where do the courts say that there is a reasonable expectation of privacy under a constitution? I mean, let's face it, we have a constitution for a reason. It defines, though not perfectly, since the word privacy doesn't even exist in our constitution, but fair, fair to say that many of us, including me, believe that privacy exists as a right in our, in our constitution, and many Supreme Court has said so. Um, and so maybe just starting there would be a good place because I, I know that there's a lot of speculation and concern among some community members about what's private and what's not. And you know, I think some of us may react if we thought, well, gosh, wait a minute, somebody's filming me at the arena, Okay, but the truth is you're there with 18,000 people and there's not a reasonable expectation of privacy when you decide to show up at an arena because we have some security concerns and have to use cameras. So I, I just think it's important for us maybe this, to think about that as a starting point is, what does the Constitution say we really have a reasonable expectation of privacy and that, that could help focus our work? Absolutely, Mayor. And it's a tricky balance um, we want to also make sure, communicate to your point, right? You are one of 18,000, but when people just hear there's a camera on you, there's a little, there's a little nerves there. Yeah. Um, and so all that to say, completely agree and more than happy to start in the city's attorney's office. And we think through that and our digital privacy policy and making sure that we are giving you just a simple list of the priorities so that we can go forth on those. Fair enough. Thank you. Of course, some people go to the arena to get on camera if they got face pain and they want to <laughs> show off their friends. Okay, Councilmember Pearls. I was just going to add to your list of potential uh, cameras or, or privacy concerns. We've had the Paragon uh, Falcon camera up for years, and you can actually see people's backyards with that thing, and it's all over YouTube. So, you know, <laughs> while you're looking at it, you might as well take a peek at that one, too. <laughs> Not to mention the concern of privacy of the Peregrine Falcons themselves, <laughs> who are mating and doing other things I'd rather not. Uh, okay, uh, any other comments or questions? Going online to see if, nope, okay, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Prowlis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Prosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, item 8.1 is a grant agreement with the Jamboree Housing Corporation for the rehab of the Pavilion Inn project. There is a presentation. Happily, we have funding and we're moving forward. Welcome, Rachel and team.
Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy Director with the Housing Department, and I am joined today by Flaherty Ward, the Director of Real Estate with the Santa Clara County Housing Authority. We are here to request City Council approval for a grant for the Pavilion Inn, which is a home key project. I just wanted to start by sharing a story about how this project was born. Um, when the state made available home key dollars, we were all challenged to think creatively about how we could serve our community in a way that made an immediate impact and housed our most vulnerable residents. In our first, when we put out our first request for information, one of the people who responded was Sparky Harlan. She raised her hand from the Bill Wilson Center and said, I would like to find a place to house transitional aged youth in San Jose. So we set out on a journey with our team and Sparky and toured five or six different hotels. We were all over San Jose trying to find the right place. Yeah, we set out on a and journey. what was interesting is that some were too big and some were too small. And when we found the pavilion, we really felt like there was a, was a fit that we wanted to pursue. Over the coming months, we actually passed on the project to the housing authority to really kind of work it out. We had an idea and the housing authority made it a project. And so today we have this project, it's ready and it's been thought out, it has been awarded by the state, the home key funds are in place and um, we are here to bring for you consideration of um, a two and a half million dollar grant that will make this all happen. So the Pavilion Inn will be converted to 43 apartments for transitional age youth. Um, the Santa Clara County Housing Authority, as I mentioned earlier, has pulled this together with a, a whole a team. There's like a team that's all kind of, everyone is playing a different part. Jamboree has been identified as the developer, the Bill Wilson Center, and the county will provide um, a service provider. There will be two different service providers on site. The housing authority will own the site and ground lease it to Jamboree, who will lead the construction activity and will be leasing the building. The city is providing a grant as gap funding to make this project financially viable. The Pavilion Inn is being funded from a variety of funding sources. The two city sources are the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Grant Program, otherwise affectionately known as HAP, and Measure E. The city's investment is approximately 8% of the total cost and will be an investment of 67,000 per unit, which is less than the typical 125,000 per unit that the city um, typically provides to fund affordable housing units. Additionally, the Pavilion Inn will start serving the targeted population in less than a year with no ongoing city obligation to fund services at the site. This is a one-time investment by the city with a rapid and significant positive impact for our transitional aged youth. I would like to take a moment to recognize the efforts of the team working on this development. Sparky Harlan from the Bill Wilson Center was instrumental in the selection of the site. Andrew Malik and Hannah Hardy from the attorney's office have worked to work through all the details. And Isaac Arona and Corey Richardson from the housing department have helped to work through um, this concept as well. This is a tremendous opportunity to bring an additional home key project to San Jose to serve our traditional aged youth, our transitional aged youth. <laughs> this concludes our presentation and we're available for any questions. All right, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Flaherty, and thanks everyone for your great work on this. Let's go to the public for comments. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Considering that from 2016 till now, uh, we haven't met 
or broken the threshold of 25% of affordable housing goals, um, this, is a, this is a bright spot in that dark history that is San Jose's history. Um, however, we have met between 2016 and now 95 to 115% of market rate housing goals. And I think those deficits compounded year over year has created this crisis that we're living in now. This is one piece in terms of making an attempt to remedy that, and I will never discount that because at least there's going to be some families that are going to have some kind of relief here in the city. However, I don't think we can uh, start congratulating ourselves and patting ourselves on the back, considering that last year, in the month of December, five people, five people died on their death certificates, stated specifically, they died of exposure. And there were certain people that took uh, responsibility for that, accepted responsibility for that. But yet I haven't seen that reflected in the policies. And so while I congratulate the city on, on, on this effort, because I know that there was a lot of red tape that, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, citizen pushback for that housing project to there, you did accomplish it. My question to you is, and my challenge to you is, what is going to be done about those deficits that was created by policies, by policies that this council has accepted failure they accepted responsibility for those failures of accommodating those deficits that were created between 2016 and today. What are you going to do about Claire Beekman? Hi, thank you, Claire Beekman here. Thanks for this item. Boy, you know, the work of community advocacy, it's a lot to learn. Good luck how we uh, share ideas with each other towards uh, working towards uh, common community goals. Uh, for this sort of item, you know, I, my feelings, uh, I really like the home key product a lot. I think it's really fairly awesome what it's capable of. But just a reminder uh, in the importance of, uh, you know, we've also can be receiving a lot of funding at this time to help with uh, more long-term subsidy housing for people that we couldn't do before. We used to only be able to subsidize people's housing, you know, homeless people's housing for uh, you know six months to a year and a half. Now we can possibly do it two to five. And that two to five year time frame really helps a person get situated. And we shouldn't be afraid of that money and that's available and, and how to use that money and to talk about that money openly. I think that's how kind of we all grew up in learning the process of how you know helping uh, unhoused house themselves can work. And now we have that opportunity now to really do that. And so for as good as this program is, we have to be organized in our other options of how we can house the unhoused. And uh, so I just wanted to mention that at this time. And uh, as always, it's an important subject that I think we have to learn how to be more and more comfortable, how to talk about the same with the previous item. We have to learn how to be comfortable to talk about some things more openly and publicly. And it takes work and practice from all of us. And I hope you can be receptive that I want to honestly and decently work towards such openness and honesty about things and decency. Thank you. Back to the council. Great, thank you. Council Member Davis. Thank you. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Rachel and her team, Flaherty and her team, and Sparky and her team for all of the work on this project. We, there's so much to like about this project. Uh, low dollar investment by the city, that's great. No ongoing costs for the city, that's great. Wonderful services for transitional age youth, awesome. Um, and it provides both transitional and permanent housing for transitional age youth. So there is a lot to like in addition to doing it in under a year, fantastic. So with that, I will move approval. Second. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Frawls? Yeah, I just wanted to express uh, gratitude for this as well. Um, I, I drive past, past this location three times a week as I drop my son off to his preschool. 
um, in D6 now. Um, and, <laughs> um, but uh, I think this is a terrific location. Uh, have always been supportive of it and, and excited to watch it as I continue to drive my son and, and see it over the years be built up. Thanks. I echo all the praise and thanks, uh, but just to be grumpy Gomer, because that's what I do. Uh, I just had a couple quick questions. Originally, there were 61 uh, rooms. We went to 41 apartments or living units. Um, can you explain, do we have to meet some minimum square footage requirement or? Thanks. Uh, at first, I want to say thank you for having me here today. I've, I know most of you, for those I don't, my name's Flaherty Ward. I'm with the Santa Clara County Housing Authority. Um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, some of the decisions, or most of the decisions we've made around the pavilion are built on what we've learned in the first couple of rounds of room key and home key. And one of those really important lessons was that we need to provide on-site service space, amenity space, and offices for the people who will be working there and supporting the people living there. So part of the units we are taking offline are being converted for those uses. We've also found that um, the units need to be updated to add kitchens, so we're doing that. And then there is uh, about 12 to 13 units that are being combined with other units to create full one bedrooms with a full kitchen and a true bedroom. Um, those are the permanent units. We anticipate those transitional age youth will have um, children and we wanna provide them larger living spaces. So those were the programmatic decisions that went into dropping the unit count down to 43. Okay, thank you, all makes sense. And, and thanks to you and Preston for taking the lead on this. Um, though, again, be grumpy Gomer, uh, we, we, we didn't get a home key award for the whole enchilada, right? Uh, the county had to kick in some money, we had to kick in some money. Is that by design from the state or just because, hey, our costs are higher than anybody else? Yeah, the home key program has a cap on how yeah. much they'll contribute. We're maximizing that. So not surprisingly, in high cost areas like the Bay Area or LA, the home key funds don't go as far and they do require local contribution. Um, so the home key funds make up about 44% of the total sources, which is great, um, but it does not cover the full enchilada. Right, um, thank you. And then, um, Rachel, you mentioned this being the a great opportunity for us to get um, transition age youth house. I totally agree. I had understood that the Sobrata house on South Third Street, when we originally launched it, that was the objective. Is is that still serving transition age youth or did they move or transition away from that? No, they are. Um, actually, I worked on that when I was <laughs> like almost 20 years ago with Reagan. Um, You're only five years old. Yeah, yeah so EHC uh, <laughs> used, to, used to operate that and then yeah. now it's Bill Wilson Center. Um, it is still serving youth. Um, okay. They have the drop-in center and then they have the transitional housing program that runs on the second floor. Okay, great to see. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. I remember being there for the ribbon cutting. Which mm -hmm. was very exciting. Um, wonderful. I know there was another question. Oh, I just wanted to say a big thank you also, in addition to everyone who has been thanked, uh, who deserve it, of course. Um, I wanted to thank uh, folks at, uh, at the state uh, who were instrumental in us getting the HAP3 money, particularly um, Senate Pro Temp uh, Tony Atkins, as well as Assemblymember Phil Ting and um, Senator Nancy Skinner. Um, and just a word of warning to the council for next year, since you won't have me to kick around anymore. Um, we're gonna have to fight for that hot money every single year. Um, and so, um, you know, we were fortunate to have a lot of mayors really aligned fighting for it every year, but it was never in the January budget, it was never in the May revise, but it's the flexible money that we got for really important projects like this. And so hopefully next year we'll be fighting again because we'll have to keep fighting, of course. Anyway, thank you. Let's vote. Um, Matt Mahan, Councilman Pandry. Matt Mahan, Pandry, Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Uh, yes, Councilman Mahan, I'm sorry. I wasn't looking on Zoom. Thanks, Mayor. No, no problem. You, you started to ask the go down the line of questioning I had. First of all, just say I, I think uh, for all the reasons enumerated, this this is a uh, a great project and and certainly serving a population that that really needs our support. So I, I am planning to vote for the project. I did want to pick up on the question about the reduction in the number of units. My rough math was that the cost per unit, uh, cost of taxpayers comes out to on the order of $700,000, which is you know, roughly the cost to build new. And so I was still trying to better understand 
why that's the case and if there are things we can do to get that that cost per unit or maybe more importantly cost per person served down in the future and 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 what's driving that is it more of the um the shared space and the, and what, what else it's i'm sure it's more than just the the kitchens and offices i would think yeah it's a it's a great question um the cost is high um what is driving that largely is the acquisition purchase price so 50 percent of the budget is just buying the hotel and the land that the hotel sits on so that's the main driver of the cost um and the rest is really uh related to construction and and soft costs and some contingency for the unknowns um if we did not combine the units and we did not add kitchens that would definitely reduce the cost but Connecting back to my earlier comments, I think programmatically we found that it's really important to provide folks, especially those, you know, we say interim, but these youth can live in these units up to three years. It's really important that they can prepare their own food and learn life skills. So we want to support that. Um, we do believe that the upfront initial investment is important to ensuring that we have stability in the outcomes we want. Um, and the housing authority is you know has stepped up to fund that gap um because we do believe that those are important design decisions to make and include okay thank you i appreciate that and uh just hope everywhere possible we're really looking to keep that cost per person down but uh appreciate the value of this project and i'll be supporting thank you okay any other comments let's vote Meadows. yes Morales. Owen. Aye. Crosco? Davis? Aye. Yes. We got you, Crosco. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lucardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Finally, uh, 8.2 are actions related to the fiscal year 21 22 consolidated annual performance and evaluation report, affectionately known as CAFR. And Reagan is here. And Tony, I'm yes on the last item. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Reagan Henninger with the Housing Department. Uh, we're here tonight for uh, the paper, which is an annual year end report that's required by HUD. It's a backward facing report reporting out on uh, statistics for last fiscal year. And it reports only on our federal entitlement funds. Uh, and we report out on these four annual or five annual report priorities that you see on the slide before you. I did also want to highlight that we did publish a supplemental memo today uh, with the Housing Commission's comments on the CAPER, which is required by HUD. Uh, and the supplemental memo also includes some data and updated program charts, primarily adding outcomes for these program. And then, as I said, it's also important to mention that the CAPER does not report out on any state funding, local funding. Um, it is only on our federal funds, which are CDBG, HOME, HOPWA, and ESG. So the first priority is uh, increase and preserve affordable housing. Our home funds funded rental assistance for 456 households. And I did want to distinguish that this is rental assistance um, that is separate from our homelessness prevention network. Um, and this, the homelessness prevention program will be reported out to you all in our annual homeless report. Our second priority is responding to homelessness. So last year we funded homeless street outreach teams with PATH and Home First and temporary overnight warming locations during the winter months, as well as uh, emergency interim housing services and operations 
at our EIHs and our bridge housing communities. We also funded an emergency motel program with Life Moves. In total, across 10 programs receiving federal funding, over 1,000 individuals found temporary or permanent housing. And that, uh, that number, again, is in that supplemental memo that we published today. Our third priority is strengthening and stabilizing communities. Here we funded uh, POSO and the Health Trust for transportation services and social wellness and support visits. And 99% of the participants uh, stated that these social visits uh, were important for their daily well being. We also funded a legal consortium led by Law Foundation Silicon Valley um, for. Uh, legal consultations related to fair housing and the implementation of the city's tenant protection ordinance. 100% of the clients represented by attorneys were able to stay in their housing um, or had additional time um, to bridge them into new housing. Also in the strengthening, strengthening neighborhoods category, uh, we funded again the health trust and POSO for senior meal services. We also funded First Five uh, for child care scholarships. This was COVID related uh, CDBG money. And then we also funded Somos Mayfair and Com University to fund leadership development in neighborhoods. Um, so this tonight's action is a uh, final public hearing on the caper. Um, our submission deadline to HUD is on the 28th. And then we'll be back before you with our annual action plan um, for next fiscal year. And we will be again holding a public hearing uh, for comment and comments will be submitted to HUD. that I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Rain. All right, let's go to the public. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. It would have been helpful to have some numbers of points of comparison, meaning that you gave numbers, but you didn't give numbers of the population that needed the service, and then the uh, number of population that you provided the service to. Now, if we had that point of comparison, then we would be able to know just what that number means. I mean, you had, for example, 35 children receive childcare assistance. Okay, that's good. 35 children received it. However, how many people need it? How many families need it? You see, now, if we had that number and we were able to have it as a point of comparison, then we would know what the city is doing and what it's not doing. When we're just receiving those numbers, we're not getting really any information at all. Absolutely none, because there's nothing to contrast it to. And so while I appreciate the, 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 the information, it's, it's, it's kind of insulting because it's incomplete. There's no point of comparison. And if there's no point of comparison, then how is the city going to measure its progress? The other thing is 25,000 meals to seniors, that's a lot. You know, and, and, and I remember one council member stating that uh, while we can congratulate ourselves that we provided 25,000 meals, the fact is, is that we're living in Silicon Valley and we have to provide 25,000 meals to seniors. There's a problem with that. You know, if we're the innovation center of the world, well then why isn't it that we can't provide some some uh, some solutions to some of these social ills that we have. We have technology. We can predict where a crime is going to be committed. We can commit an arrest, but we can't solve the problems that we have that re are related to poverty, related to child care, and related to women that are bearing the brunt of supporting single families. Back to the council. Thank you. Council Member Cohen. Yeah, 
Uh, thank you, Reagan, for the report and for all the tremendous work that your team's doing. There's a lot of a, a lot of um, different initiatives to keep track of. Um, I just have a couple questions, um, mostly that came from the supplemental memo today. I noticed some differences in some of the exiting numbers in the between the two memos. Can you just talk about that for a minute? Because I was actually going to ask before about the lower percentages on the original memo, but now the percentages have gone up for people, for example, exited from EIH into other housing. So what happened between the those two? Yeah, we um, when we were pulling out the outcomes, what changed was really like a uh, what's considered a successful exit. So someone may be exiting an EIH or a BHC to other temporary housing, but we may consider that a successful exit. For example, if they're exiting into some other system of care, they may be exiting um, to live in a sober living environment, for example, we consider that a successful exit again, exiting into another uh, system of care and not back out onto the streets. So uh, that's just one example of sort of how we counted. Um, yeah, I see now that you, you, you added the word temporary. So that before it was into permanent housing, now it's into some other form of housing. Yeah, so I think the yeah. exits to permanent uh, tells a portion of the story, but probably not yeah. the full picture of really the, the work and the support services that's happening at an EIH or a BHC in terms of making sure people are on a path that's right for them. Again, with that example of someone exiting to a sober liver, living environment, that's the path that's right for them and, and what their health needs are. No, I appreciate that. I mean, I think it's important you're defining success in a, in a certain way. And maybe there's a breakdown that can occur in the future that talks about permanent and temporary. I mean, both are successful but they're different types of result. Um, so for those, for example, for those, this one example with 189 exited, 129, 68% went into housing. That means that there's another 32% or 60 people. They were back on the street. Is that what that's telling us? Um, <laughs> potentially either back out on the streets. Um, we did have a, a couple of deaths, so. Okay, so, it, I mean, I've always been, it, it is good to see 70% success rate, so that's really, really good. I um, just want to be, understand what's going on in the other cases. There were different providers at different sites, at the two different EIH sites, right? There's the Home First and couple sites, and then there's PATH. Do we have any feeling for whether one is, I know there are different, maybe different types of clientele as well. Is that, does that help explain disparity in success rates at the sites, or is there some difference that the providers are doing in terms of how they, how successful they are? So, um, the, the BHCs, our bridge housing communities, have a different staffing ratio than our emergency interim housing communities. Our BHCs have less staff and were originally set up um, to work with a clientele that um, were higher functioning, were work ready, uh, were enrolled in a rapid rehousing program versus our emergency interim housing um, communities. They have a higher staff level and a higher level of support um, because we, we started those in during our COVID response when we were taking uh, older individuals with underlying health conditions. So the staffing is a little bit different at a BHC versus an EIH. And I think that's one um, reason for a difference in results. We also see at EIHs a higher level of people wanting to go to an EIH because they really appreciate having um, a bigger space and their own private bathroom and shower. Um, less people wanting to go to a BHC where it's a much smaller um, emergency sleeping cabin. And then a BHC has just fewer units. So I think, you know, you're going to see less kind of 
turnover as well. Yeah, I'm looking also then, at the two, I'm sorry, the two emer two EIH sites. Yeah, so the, 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 there's the Home First EIH sites and then there's the PATH EIH site, which serves families. And I think when you're serving a family, it's a very different service model. Um, typically families, um, are oftentimes easier to serve. When we've been working with the population at our EIHs, especially over the last year, we've been taking adults from targeted encampments, specifically uh, Guadalupe Gardens, and we've been taking adults who have a wide range of abilities and disabilities. Some of them have um, very severe health challenges uh, that that prevent them from achieving stable housing or working um, versus a family it's just a much different dynamic and so that I think that's why you see the, the higher success okay. rate as the path the age okay thank you um the, the this data these data are for the history of the site right since the site's open is it is that right or is this over some specific time period the data is from July 2021 to June. So it's for that fiscal year. Yeah. And then the expenditure and allocation numbers are fiscal year allocation or are they? So in every case, we were we underspent by a lot and it's good to, always good to save money. But is that was was there an expectation that we would need to spend more and we didn't? Is there a reason why there there was less spending than we allocated for that fiscal year? I think last fiscal year was unique and unlike a fiscal year that I've experienced working with nonprofits. Um, nonprofits, just like government, just like private sector, are experiencing the great resignation that came with COVID. They're having trouble both recruiting and retaining uh, staff. That is, I would say, the largest probably reason for decreased spending amongst all so, of our nonprofits. So our sites didn't have the staffing we anticipated they would have. So we had to spend less delays on them. in hiring staffing. Um, so we could flip yeah. that around and say given that this high success rates are pretty good outcomes given that we had expected to have more staff more at those staff. sites. And then the money that was not spent is money that will carry over to allocate for for the next fiscal year. Correct. All right, I'll move the approval, the acceptance of this report. Second. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that back and forth was very illuminating. Thank you, Reagan. All right, any other comments, questions? All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Frosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Oli? Yes. Aye. Mahan? Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Jimenez? Yes. Mahan? Motion passes. Aye. Got you. All right. Uh, we're now on to open forum. Thanks, Reagan. Terry, William Terry Williams? Did you want to um, do the adjournment while Terry comes down to the microphone? Yes. yes. Okay, Better late than you. never. Um, especially since we're adjourning the meeting uh, in Joe's honor, I did find the photo. So we're gonna put the photo up while we do our public comment. Okay, Terry, go ahead. My name's Terry Williams. I'm a former city employee. And the reason I'm here is because I think there's a couple muni code sections that deal with the federated employee retirement system that discriminate against people that have a disability retirement. These two muni code sections, I sent you guys all the council members, each district an email and the mayor email prior to this meeting. There's section 3.281325, report of earnings for outside occupation and 3.281330, deductions, earnings for the outside occupation. I started working for this city at the age of 14 years old, part-time. I became full-time in 1994. I got a disability retirement in 2006 when I was a police dispatcher. I gave up my retirement, came back to work as a crime prevention specialist, and I was laid off in 2010. 
Since then, I have sought outside employment. Every year, I have to report my earnings. If I earn too much, I have to repay retirement. I totally get that. I understand that. My problem is the muni codes for the federated plan do not acknowledge that you can be under the age of 55 and retire at 30 years of service. The other retirement plan in the city acknowledges that and treats their regular retirees the same as their disability retirees. This November, I'd be at 30 years of service and I'd be retiring. But unfortunately, at 51 now, I have to report for four more years. I don't think that's fair. The city hired me at 14. They hire people under the age of 25. And if you're under the age of 25, you're going to reach retirement before 55. I just want to be treated fair and it to be equal amongst disabled employees and regular employees. And I hope you guys give me support for that in amending the amenity code. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Blair Beekman. All right. Thank you. Blair Beekman here. Uh, with the UN General Assembly taking place in New York City in the next few weeks, I hope it can be discussed how war and fighting could be suspended until at least next spring in the Ukraine. And from this, thought, space, rest, peace, and negotiation can take place this fall and winter. Please consider that to begin a uh, current peace negotiation process in the Ukraine at this time may arrive at much the same place as the use of continual war in the next few years. And a very much of a thank you that with new uh, electricity grid planning and loan sharing ideas and with the future of new developments, uh, the mayor and city council openly considered at the public meeting study session last Friday, the options of municipal power and community energy use. The concept of bringing these ideas within local control and public oversight of everyday persons of a community is an incredibly important subject matter to talk about. And it's just so much of a thank you that you took the time and, and care to want to address issues in those terms. This brings out what we talked about at today's meeting that I hope I can better talk about at tomorrow's meeting. I had a whole section of my life that I can talk about flock issues that um, were not very well addressed today. And I, I very much of a thank you, Councilperson Esparza, just directly asked a question of Flock. Uh, Flock did not answer very well. And that's the sort of issue that I'm asking yourselves that we have to learn as a community that we don't have to fear and that we can trust answering this question. And we can trust answering questions about the bundling issues that are involved and not to fear that subject matter. I'm not out to play gotcha. I'm working as a full community effort, how we make a trusting community future process. And that takes work and, and, and care and, and, and kindness from all of us. And that doesn't take government acting insensitively towards community when they say they are trying to be open and address these things. Mayor. Oh, oh sorry, we have one more. Uh, yes, Paul Soto. Um, I would like to, in honor of National Hispanic Month, I want to honor the Chicano community because it was the Chicano community here in San Jose. They didn't identify as Hispanics. They would find that disrespectful. They also didn't identify themselves as Latino or Latinx. A Chicano is a Chicano, and that is a person that has both parents that were born right here in Estados Unidos, right here in Califas. That's how they, they identify. And the reason why they identify that is because this is their home. San Jose is their home. We don't have a, a, a longing for Sonora or Chihuacan or, 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 or any of these other states. They have a longing for San Jose. And they, they are the fomenters of three of the most powerful civil rights movements of the 20th century. The Chicano movement, 1968, when the students walked out in protest of the fact that there was only 0.1% of the student body was Chicano at San Jose State, yet we were 20% of the population. Number two, the low rider movement. The low rider movement was the artistic and creative expression of the sons and daughters of Campesinos de Sassipuedes. And we put low rider magazine on the map. We put low rider culture and marketed it to the world out of a building right there on Willow Street. That's where it came from. The first issue of low rider was produced in a building on Willow Street in 1975. Thirdly, the farm workers movement. The farm workers movement and the Black Berets. I'd like to acknowledge Jackie Barra. I want to acknowledge Jack Brito. I want to acknowledge Ernestina Garcia. 
I want to acknowledge Consuelo Rodriguez, who is a teacher, and Jose Carrasco, who were teachers at Roosevelt High School, when Roosevelt High School was shut down because of the abuse of children, and it was the Chicano community, the Chicano community that fought and made sure that we had 10 districts instead of five. We need to acknowledge. Back to the council. Mayor. Yes. So this meeting is the last meeting for somebody. I'm yes, sure you're going to say a Smith. few words. Yes. Henry has been with us through thick and thin and <laughs> pandemic and everything else. He's abandoning us to go home to San Diego uh, onto uh, other uh, pursuits. We're very, very grateful for Henry's service. Thank you, Councilmember Sparza, for recognizing Henry. Yes. Yes. Uh, and he won't have to put up with me anymore. So good for him. Uh, Henry, good luck. The meeting's adjourned. Good luck, Henry.